This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Travels in the Interior of Africa. Introduction the first of the two volumes which contained mungo park's travel in the interior of africa brought him through many perils to the first sight of the niger and left him sick and solitary stripped of nearly all that he possessed a half-starved white man on a half-starved horse he was helped on by a bag of cowries from a kindly chief but in this volume he has not advanced far before he is stripped of it all there is not in the range of english literature a more interesting traveller's tale than was given to the world in this book which this volume completes it took the deeper hold upon its readers because it appeared at a time when english hearts began to be stirred by the wrongs of slavery but at any time there would be strong human interest in the unconscious painting of the writer's character as he makes his way over far regions in which no white man had before been seen with firm resolve and with good temper as well as courage and prudence which bring him safe through many a hair breath escape there was a true kindness in mungo park that found answering kindness and brought out the spirit of humanity in those upon whose good will his life depends in the negroes often although never in the moors there was no flinching in the man who when robbed of his horse stripped to the shirt in a forest and left upon a lion's track looked down with a botanist's eye on the beauty of a tawny moss at his feet drew comfort from it and labored on with a quiet faith in god the same eye was as quick to recognize the diverse characters of men in mungo park shrewd humor and right feeling went together whatever he had to say he said clearly and simply and it went straight home he had the good fortune to be born before picturesque writing was invented when we return to the gambia with mungo park under the same escort with a coffle of slaves on their way to be shipped for the use of christians from the strength of his unlabored narrative we get clear knowledge unclouded by a rainbow mist of words he is of one blood with the sailors in whom hackluck delighted volume two chapter sixteen villages on the niger determines to go no farther eastward being in the manner that has been related compelled to leave sago i was conducted the same evening to a village about seven miles to the eastward with some of the inhabitants of which my guide was acquainted and by whom we were well received he was very friendly and communicative and spoke highly of the hospitality of his countrymen but withal told me that if jean was the place of my destination which he seemed to have hitherto doubted i had undertaken an enterprise of greater danger than probably i was apprised of for all for although the town of jean was normally part of the king of bambara's dominions it was in fact he said a city of the moors the leading part of the inhabitants being bushreens and even the governor himself though appointed by masong of the same sect thus was i in danger of falling a second time into the hands of men who would consider it not only justifiable but meritous to destroy me and this reflection was aggravated by the circumstance that the danger increased as i advanced in my journey for i learned that the places beyond jean were under the moorish influence in a still greater degree than jean itself 
and timbuktu the great object of my search altogether in possession of that savage and merciless people who allowed no christian to live there but i had now advanced too far to think of returning to the westward on such vague and uncertain information and determined to proceed and being accompanied by the guide i departed from the village on the morning of the twenty fourth about eight o'clock we passed a large town called kaba situated in the midst of a beautiful and highly cultivated country bearing a greater resemblance to the centre of england than to what i should have supposed had been the middle of africa the people were everywhere employed in collecting the fruit of shade trees from which they prepare the vegetable butter mentioned in former parts of this work these trees grow in great abundance over this part of bambara they are not planted by the natives but are found growing naturally in the woods and in clearing woodland for cultivation every tree is cut down but the shay the tree itself very much resembles the american oak and the fruit from the kernel of which being first dried in the sun the butter is prepared by boiling the kernel in water has somewhat the appearance of a spanish olive the kernel is enveloped in a sweet pulp under a thin green rind and the butter produced from it besides the advantage of its keeping the whole year without salt is whiter firmer and to my palate of a richer flavour than the best butter i ever tasted made from cow's milk the growth and preparation of this commodity seemed to be among the first objects of an african industry in this and the neighbouring states and it constitutes a main article of their inland commerce we passed in the course of the day a great many villages inhabited chiefly by fishermen and in the evening about five o'clock arrived at san sanding a very large town containing as i was told from eight to ten thousand inhabitants this place is much resorted to by the moors who bring salt from Buru and beads and coral from the mediterranean to exchange here for gold and cotton cloth this cloth they sell to great advantage in Buru and other moorish countries where on account of the want of rain no cotton is cultivated i desired my guide to conduct me to the house in which we were to lodge by the most private way possible we accordingly rode along between the town and the river passing by a creek or harbour in which i observed twenty large canoes most of them fully loaded and covered with mats to prevent the rain from injuring the goods as we proceeded three other canoes arrived two with passengers and one with goods i was happy to find that all the negro inhabitants took me for a moor under which character i should probably have passed unmolested had not a moor who was sitting by the riverside discovered the mistake and setting up a loud exclamation brought together a number of his countrymen when i arrived at the house of county mammy d the duty of the town i was surrounded with hundreds of people speaking a variety of different dialects all equally intelligible to me at length by the assistance of my guide who acted as interpreter i understood that one of the spectators pretended to have seen me at one place and another at some other place and a moorish woman absolutely swore that she had kept my house three years at galam on the river senegal it was plain that they mistook me for some other person and i desired two of the most confident to point towards the place where they had seen me they pointed due south hence i think it probable that they came from cape coast where they might have seen many white men their language was different 
from any i had yet heard the moors now assembled in great number with their usual arrogance compelling the negroes to stand at a distance they immediately began to question me concerning my religion but finding that i was not master of arabic they sent for two men whom they call e hudi or jews in hopes that they might be able to converse with me these jews in dress and appearance very much resemble the arabs but though they so far conform to the religion of mohammed as to recite in public prayers from the koran they are but little respected by the negroes and even the moors themselves allowed that though i was a christian it was a better man than a jew they however insisted that like the jews i must conform so far as to repeat the mohammedan prayers and when i attempted to waive the subject by telling them that i could not speak arabic one of them a sharif from tuat in the great desert started up and swore by the prophet that if i refused to go to the mosque he would be one that would assist in carrying me thither and there is no doubt that this threat would have been immediately executed had not my landlord interposed on my behalf he told them that i was the king's stranger and he could not see me ill-treated whilst i was under his protection he therefore advised them to let me alone for the night assuring them that in the morning i should be sent about my business this somehow appeased their clamor but they compelled me to ascend a high seat by the door of the mosque in order that everybody might see me for the people had assembled in such numbers as to be quite ungovernable climbing upon the houses and squeezing each other like the spectators at an execution upon this seat i remained until sunset when i was conducted into a neat little hut with a small court before it the door of which count mamadi shut to prevent any person from disturbing me but this precaution could not exclude the moors they climbed over the top of the mud wall and came in crowds into the court in order they said to see me perform my evening devotions and eat eggs the former of these ceremonies i did not think proper to comply with but i told them that i had no objection to eat eggs provided they would bring me eggs to eat my landlord immediately brought me seven hen's eggs and was much surprised to find that i could not eat them raw for it seemed to be a prevalent opinion among the inhabitants of the interior the europeans subsist almost entirely on this diet when i had succeeded in persuading my landlord that this opinion was without foundation and that i would gladly partake of, of any victuals which he might think proper to send me he ordered a sheep to be killed and part of it to be dressed for my supper about midnight when the moors had left me he paid me a visit and with much earnestness desired me to write him a safi if a moor's safi is good said the hospitable old man a white man's must needs be better i readily furnished him with one possessed of all the virtues i could concentrate for it contained the lord's prayer the pen with which it was written was made of a reed a little charcoal and gum water made very tarble ink and a thin board answered the purpose of paper july twenty fifth early in the morning before the murrers were assembled i departed from san sanding and slept the ensuing night at a small town called sibili from whence on the day following i reached Nyera a large town at some distance from the river where i halted the twenty-seventh to have my clothes washed and to recruit my horse 
the duty there had a very commodious house a flat roofed and two stories high he showed me some gunpowder of his own manufacturing and pointed out as a great curiosity a little brown monkey that was tied to a stake by the door telling me that it came from a far distant country called kong july twenty eighth i departed from niara and reached niami about noon this town is inhabited chiefly by fulas from the kingdom of massina the duty i know not why would not receive me but civilly sent his son on horseback to conduct me to modibu which he assured me was at no great distance we rode nearly in a direct line through the woods but in general went forwards with great circumspection i observed that my guide frequently stopped and looked under the bushes on inquiring the reason of this caution he told me that lions were very numerous in that part of the country and frequently attack people travelling through the woods while he was speaking my horse started and looking round i observed a large animal of the camel leopard kind standing at a little distance the neck and forelegs were very long the head was furnished with two short black horns turning backwards the tail which reached down to the ham joint had a tuft of hair at the end the animal was of a mouse colour and it trotted away from us in a very sluggish manner moving its head from side to side to see if we were pursuing it shortly after this as we were crossing a large open plain where there were a few scattered bushes my guide who was a little way before me wheeled his horse round in a moment calling out something in the fula language which i did not understand i inquired in mandingo what he meant wara billy billy a very large lion said he and made signs for me to ride away but my horse was too much fatigued so we rode slowly past the bush from which the animal had given us the alarm not seeing anything myself however i thought my guide had been mistaken when the fula suddenly put his hand to his mouth exclaiming supa and ali god preserve us and to my great surprise i then perceived a large red lion at a short distance from the bush with his head couched between his forepaws i expected he would instantly spring upon me and instinctively pulled my feet from my stirrups to throw myself on the ground that my horse might become the victim rather than myself but it is probable the lion was not hungry for he quietly suffered us to pass though we were fairly within his reach my eyes were so riveted upon the sovereign of the beasts that i found it impossible to remove them until we were at a considerable distance we now took a circuitous route through some swampy ground to avoid any more of these disagreeable encounters at sunset we arrived at modibu a delightful village on the banks of the niger commanding a view of the river for many miles both to the east and west the small green islands the peaceful retreat of some industrious fulas whose cattle are here secure from the depredations of wild beasts and the majestic breadth of the river which is here much larger than at sago render the situation one of the most enchanting in the world here are caught great plenty of fish by means of long cotton nets which the natives make themselves and used nearly in the same manner as nets are used in europe i observed the head of a crocodile lying upon one of the houses which they told me had been killed by the shepherds in a swamp near the town these animals are not uncommon in the niger but i believe they are not oftentimes found dangerous 
they are of little account to the traveller when compared with the amazing swarms of mosquitoes which rise from the swamps and creeks in such numbers as to harass even the most torpid of the natives and as my clothes were now almost worn to rags i was but ill prepared to resist their attacks i usually passed the night without shutting my eyes walking backwards and forwards fanning myself with my hat their stings raised numerous blisters on my legs and arms which together with the want of rest made me very feverish and uneasy july twenty ninth early in the morning my landlord observing that i was sickly hurried me away sending a servant with me as a guide to key but though i was little able to walk my horse was still less able to carry me and about six miles to the east of modibu in crossing some rough clayey ground he fell and the united strength of the guide and myself could not place him again upon his legs i sat down for some time beside this worn-out associate of my adventures but finding him still unable to rise i took off the saddle and bridle and placed a quantity of grass before him i surveyed the poor animal as he lay panting on the ground with sympathetic emotion for i could not suppress the sad apprehension that i should myself in a short time lie down and perish in the same manner of fatigue and hunger with this foreboding i left my poor horse and with great reluctance followed my guide on foot along the bank of the river until about noon when we reached key which i found to be nothing more than a small fishing village the duty assured the old man who was sitting by the gate received me very coolly and when i informed him of my situation and begged his protection told me with great indifference that he paid very little attention to fine speeches and that i should not enter his house my guide remonstrated in my favour but to no purpose for the duty remained inflexible in his determination i knew not where to rest my wearied limbs but was happily relieved by a fishing canoe belonging to scylla which was at that moment coming down the river the duty waved to the fisherman to come near and desired him to take charge of me as far as Morzen. the fisherman after some hesitation consented to carry me and i embarked in the canoe in company with the fisherman his wife and a boy the negro who had conducted me from modibu now left me i requested him to look to my horse on his return and take care of him if he was still alive which he promised to do departing from key we proceeded about a mile down the river when the fisherman paddled the canoe to the bank and desired me to jump out having tied the canoe to a stake he stripped off his clothes and dived for such a length of time that i thought he had actually drowned himself and was surprised to see his wife behave with so much indifference upon the occasion but my fears were over when he raised up his head astern of the canoe and called for a rope with this rope he dived a second time and then got into the canoe and ordered the boy to assist him in pulling at length they brought up a large basket about ten feet in diameter containing two fine fish which the fisherman after returning the basket into the water immediately carried ashore and hid in the grass we then went a little farther down and took up another basket in which was one fish the fisherman now left us to carry his prizes to some neighboring market and the women and boy proceeded with me in the canoe down the river about four o'clock we arrived at morzan a fishing town on the northern bank from whence i was conveyed across the river to scylla 
a large town where i remained until it was quite dark under a tree surrounded by hundreds of people with a great deal of entreaty the duty allowed me to come into his balloon to avoid the rain but the place was very damp and i had a small paroxysm of fever during the night worn down by sickness exhausted with hunger and fatigue half naked and without any article of value by which i might procure provisions clothes or lodging i began to reflect seriously on my situation i was now convinced by painful experience that the obstacles to my farther progress were unsurmountable the tropical rains were already set in with all their violence the rice grounds and swamps were everywhere overflowed and in a few days more travelling of every kind unless by water would be completely obstructed the cowries which remained of the king of bambara's present were not sufficient to enable me to hire a canoe for any great distance and i had but little hopes of subsisting by charity in a country where the moors had such influence but above all i perceived that i was advancing more and more within the power of those merciless fanatics and from my reception both at sago and san sanding i was apprehensive that attempting to reach even jenny unless under the protection of some man of consequence amongst them which i had no means of obtaining i should sacrifice my life to no purpose for my discoveries would perish with me the prospect either way was gloomy in returning to the gambia a journey on foot of many hundred miles presented itself to my contemplation through regions and countries unknown nevertheless this seemed to be the only alternative for i saw inevitable destruction in attempting to proceed to the eastward with this conviction on my mind i hope my readers will acknowledge that i did right in going no farther having thus brought my mind after much doubt and perplexity to a determination to return westward i thought it incumbent on me before i left scylla to collect from the moorish and negro traders all the information i could concerning the farther course of the niger eastward and the situation and extent of the kingdoms in its vicinity and the following few notices i received from such various quarters as induce me to think they are authentic two short days journey to the eastward of scylla is the town of jenne which is situated on a small island in the river and is said to contain a great number of inhabitants than sago itself or any other town in bambara at the distance of two days more the river spreads into a considerable lake called dibi or the dark lake concerning the extent of which all the information i could obtain was that in crossing it from west to east the canoes lose sight of land one whole day from this lake the water issues in many different streams which terminate in two large branches one whereof flows towards the northeast and the other to the east but these branches join at cabra which is one day's journey to the southward of timbuktu and the port or shipping place of that city the tract of land which the two streams encircle is called jinbala and is inhabited by negroes and the whole distance by land from jenny to timbuktu is twelve days journey from cabra at the distance of eleven days journey down the stream the river passes to the southward of hosa which is two days journey distant from the river of the farther progress of this great river and its final exit all the natives with whom i conversed seem to be entirely ignorant their commercial pursuits seldom induce them to travel farther than the cities of timbuktu and hausa 
and as the sole object of these journeys is the acquirement of wealth they pay little attention to the course of rivers or the geography of countries it is however highly probable that the niger affords a safe and easy communication between very remote nations all my informants agreed that many of the negro merchants who arrive at timbuktu and hausa from eastward speak a different language from that of bambara or any other kingdom with which they are acquainted but even these merchants it would seem are ignorant of the termination of the river for such of them as can speak arabic describe the amazing length of its course in very general terms saying only that they believe it runs to the world's end the names of many kingdoms to the eastward of hosa are familiar to the inhabitants of bambara i was shown quivers and arrows of very curious workmanship which i was informed came from the kingdom of cassina on the north bank of the niger at short distance from Silla, is the kingdom of Messina, which is inhabited by Fulas. They employ themselves there, as in other places, chiefly in pasturage, and pay an annual tribute to the king of Bambara for the lands which they occupy. To the northeast of Messina is situated the kingdom of Timbuktu, the great object of European research the capital of this kingdom being one of the principal marts for that extensive commerce which the moors carry on with the negroes the hopes of acquiring wealth in this pursuit and zeal for propagating their religion have filled this extensive city with moors and mohammedan converts the king himself and all the chief officers of state are moors and they are said to be more severe and intolerant in their principles than any other of the moorish tribes in this part of africa i was informed by a venerable old negro that when he first visited timbuktu he took up his lodgings at a sort of public inn the landlord of which when he conducted him into his hut spread a mat on the floor and laid a rope upon it saying if you are a muslimman you are my friend sit down but if you are a kaffir you are my slave and with this rope i will lead you to market the present king of timbuktu is named abu abrahima he is reported to possess immense riches his wives and concubines are said to be clothed in silk and the chief officers of state live in considerable splendor the whole expense of his government is defrayed as i was told by a tax upon merchandise which is collected at the gates of the city the city of hosa the capital of a large kingdom of the same name situated to the eastward of timbuktu is another great mart for moorish commerce i conversed with many merchants who had visited that city and they all agreed that it is larger and more populous than timbuktu the trade police and government are nearly the same in both but in hosa the negroes are in greater proportion to the moors and have some share in the government concerning the small kingdom of jinbala i was not able to collect much information the soil is said to be remarkably fertile and the whole country so full of creeks and swamps that the moors have hitherto been baffled in every attempt to subdue it the inhabitants are negroes and some of them are said to live in considerable affluence particularly those near the capital which is a resting place for such merchants as transport goods from timbuktu to the western parts of africa to the southward of jinbala is situated the negro kingdom of gato which is said to be of great extent it was formerly divided into a number of petty states which were governed by their own chiefs 
but their private quarrels invited invasion from the neighboring kingdoms at length a politic chief by the name of musi had address enough to make them unite in hostilities against bambara and on this occasion he was unanimously chosen general the different chiefs consenting for a time to act under his command musi immediately dispatched a fleet of canoes loaded with provisions from the banks of the lake dibi up the niger towards jenny and with the whole of his army pushed forwards into bambara he arrived on the bank of the niger opposite to jenny before the townspeople had the smallest intimation of his approach his fleet of canoes joined him the same day and having landed the provisions he embarked part of his army and in the night took jenny by storm this event so terrified the king of bambara that he sent messengers to sue for peace and in order to obtain it consented to deliver to mossi a certain number of slaves every year and return everything that had been taken from the inhabitants of gato mossi thus triumphant returned to gato where he was declared king and the capital of the country is called by his name on the west of gato is the kingdom of Beidou, which was conquered by the present king of bambara about seven years ago and has continued tributary to him ever since west of Beidou is manaea the inhabitants of which according to the best information i was able to collect are cruel and ferocious carrying their resentment towards their enemies so far as never to give quarter and even to indulge themselves with unnatural and disgusting banquets of human flesh volume two chapter seventeen more zen to tafara having for the reasons assigned in the last chapter determined to proceed no farther eastward than Scylla, i acquainted the duty with my intention of returning to sego proposing to travel along the southern side of the river but he informed me that from the number of creeks and swamps on that side it was impossible to travel by any other route than along the northern bank and even that route he said would soon be impassable on account of the overflowing of the river however as he commended my determination to return westward he agreed to speak to some of the fishermen to carry me over to morzan i accordingly stepped into a canoe about eight o'clock in the morning of july thirtieth and in about an hour was landed at morzan at this place i hired a canoe for sixty cowries and in the afternoon arrived at key where for forty cowries more the duty permitted me to sleep in the same hut with one of his slaves this poor negro perceiving that i was sickly and that my clothes were very ragged humanely lent me a large cloth to cover me for the night july thirty first the duty's brother being going to modibu i embraced the opportunity of accompanying him thither there being no beaten road he promised to carry my saddle which i had left at key when my horse fell down in the woods as i now proposed to present it to the king of bambara we departed from key at eight o'clock and about a mile to the westward observed on the bank of the river a great number of earthen jars piled up together they were very neatly formed but not glazed and were evidently of that sort of pottery which is manufactured at downey a town to the west of timbuktu and sold to great advantage in different parts of bambara as we approached towards the jars my companion plucked up a large handful of herbage and threw it upon them making signs for me to do the same which i did he then with great seriousness told me that these jars belonged to some supernatural power 
that they were found in their present situation about two years ago and as no person had claimed them every traveller as he passed them from respect to the invisible proprietor threw some grass or the branch of a tree upon the heap to defend the jars from the rain thus conversing we travelled in the most friendly manner until unfortunately we perceived the footsteps of a lion quite fresh in the mud near the river side my companion now proceeded with great circumspection and at last coming to some thick underwood he insisted that i should walk before him i endeavoured to excuse myself by alleging that i did not know the road but he obstinately persisted and after a few high words and menacing looks threw down the saddle and went away this very much disconcerted me but as i had given up all hopes of attaining a horse i could not think of encumbering myself with the saddle and taking off the stirrups and girths i threw the saddle into the river the negro no sooner saw me throw the saddle into the water than he came running from the, among the bushes where he had concealed himself jumped into the river and by help of his spear brought out the saddle and ran away with it i continued my course along the bank but as the wood was remarkably thick and i had reason to believe that a lion was at no great distance i became much alarmed and took a long circuit through the bushes to avoid him about four in the afternoon i reached motibu where i found my saddle the guide who had got there before me being afraid that i should inform the king of his conduct had brought the saddle with him in a canoe while i was conversing with the duty and remonstrating against the guide for having left me in such a situation i heard a horse neigh in one of the huts and the duty inquired with a smile if i knew who was speaking to me he explained himself by telling me that my horse was still alive and somewhat recovered from his fatigue but he insisted that i should take him along with me adding that he had once kept a moor's horse for four months and when the horse had recovered and got into good condition the moor returned and claimed it and refused to give him any reward for his trouble august first i departed from motibu driving my horse before me and in the afternoon reached niami where i remained three days during which time it rained without intermission and with such violence that no person could venture out of doors august fifth i departed from niami but the country was so deluged that i was frequently in danger of losing the road and had to wade across the savannas for miles together knee-deep in water even the corn ground which is the driest land in the country was so completely flooded that my horse twice stuck fast in the mud and was not got out without the greatest difficulty in the evening of the same day i arrived at niara where i was well received by the duty as the sixth was rainy i did not depart until the morning of the seventh but the water had swelled to such a height that in many places the road was scarcely passable and though i waded wet breast deep across the swamps i could only reach a small village called niambu where however for a hundred cowries i procured from some fulas plenty of corn for my horse and milk for myself august the eighth the difficulties i had experienced the day before made me anxious to engage a fellow traveller particularly as i was assured that in the course of a few days the country would be so completely overflowed as to render the road utterly impassable but though i offered two hundred cowries for a guide nobody would accompany me however on the morning following august ninth a moor and his wife riding upon two bullocks and bound for sago with salt passed the village and agreed to take me along with them 
but I found them of little service, for they were wholly unacquainted with the road, and being accustomed to a sandy soil, were very bad travellers. Instead of waiting before the bullocks to feel if the ground was solid, the woman boldly entered the first swamp, riding upon the top of the load. But when she had proceeded about two hundred yards, the bullocks sunk into a hole and threw both the load and herself among the reeds. The frightened husband stood for some time seeming petrified with horror, and suffered his wife to be almost drowned before he went to her assistance. About sunset we reached Sidby, but the duty received me very coolly, and when I solicited for a guide to San Sanding, he told me his people were otherwise employed. I was shown into a damp old hut, where I passed a very uncomfortable night, for when the walls of the huts are softened by the rain, they frequently become too weak to support the weight of a roof. I heard three huts fall during the night, and was apprehensive that the hut I lodged in would be the fourth. In the morning, as I went to pull some grass for my horse, I counted fourteen huts which had fallen in this manner since the commencement of the rainy season. It continued to rain with great violence all the tenth, and the duty refused to give me any provisions. I purchased some corn, which I divided with my horse. August 11th. The duty compelled me to depart from the town, and I set out for San Sanding without any great hopes of faring better than I had done at Sibiti, for I learned from people who came to visit me that a report prevailed and was universally believed that I had come to Bambara as a spy, and as Masong had not admitted me into his presence, the duties of the different towns were at liberty to treat me in what manner they pleased. From repeatedly hearing the same story, I had no doubt of the truth of it, but as there was no alternative, I determined to proceed, and a little before sunset I arrived at San Sanding. My reception was what I expected. Count Mamadi, who had been so kind to me formerly, scarcely gave me welcome. Everyone wished to shun me, and my landlord sent a person to inform me that a very unfavorable report was received from Sago concerning me, and that he wished me to depart early in the morning. About ten o'clock at night, County Mamdi himself came privately to me and informed me that Masong had dispatched a canoe to Jenny to bring me back, and he was afraid I should find great difficulty in going to the west country. He advised me, therefore, to depart from San Sanding before daybreak, and cautioned me against stopping at Digani, or any town near Sago. August 12th. I departed from San Sanging and reached Kaba in the afternoon. As I approached the town, I was surprised to see several people assembled at the gate, one of whom, as I advanced, came running towards me, and taking my horse by the bridle, led me round the walls of the town, and then pointing to the west, told me to go along, or it would fare worse with me. It was in vain that I represented the danger of being benighted in the woods, exposed to the inclemency of the weather and the fury of wild beasts. Go along, was all the answer, and a number of people coming up and urging me in the same manner, with great earnestness, I suspected that some of the king's messengers who were sent in search of me were in the town, and that these negroes, from mere kindness, conducted me past it with a view to facilitate my escape. I accordingly took the road for Sego, with the uncomfortable prospect of passing the night on the branches of a tree. After travelling about three miles, I came to a small village near the road. The duty was splitting sticks by the gate, but I found I could have no admittance when I attempted to enter, 
he jumped up and with the stick he held it in his hand threatened to strike me off the horse if i presumed to advance another step at a little distance from this village and further from the road is another small one i conjured that being rather out of the commune, common route the inhabitants might have fewer objections to give me house room for the night and having crossed some cornfields i sat down under a tree by the well two or three women came to draw water and one of them perceiving i was a stranger inquired whither i was going i told her i was going for sego but being benighted on the road i wished to stay at the village until morning and begged she would acquaint the duty with my situation in a little time the duty sent for me and permitted me to sleep in a large balloon august thirteenth about ten o'clock i reached a small village within half a mile of sego where i endeavored but in vain to procure some provisions every one seemed anxious to avoid me and i can plainly perceive by the looks and behavior of the inhabitants that some very unfavorable accounts had been circulated concerning me i was again informed that masong had sent people to apprehend me and the duty's son told me that i had no time to lose if i wished to get safe out of bambara i now fully saw the danger of my situation and determined to avoid sego altogether i accordingly mounted my horse and taking the road for digali travelled as fast as i could till i was out of sight of the villagers when i struck to the westward through high grass and swampy ground about noon i stopped under a tree to consider what course to take for i had now no doubt that the moors and slatties had misinformed the king respecting the object of my mission and that people were absolutely in search of me to convey me prisoner to sago sometimes i had thoughts of swimming my horse across the niger and going to the southward for cape coast but reflecting that i had ten days to travel before i should reach kong and afterwards an extensive country to traverse inhabited by various nations whose language and manners i was totally unacquainted i relinquished this scheme and judged that i should better answer the purpose of my mission by proceeding to the westward along the niger endeavoring to ascertain how far the river was navigable in that direction having resolved upon this course i proceeded accordingly and a little before sunset arrived at a fula village called subu where for two hundred cowries i procured lodging for the night august fourteenth i continued my course along the bank of the river through a populous and well-cultivated country i passed a walled town called camellia without stopping and at noon rode through a large town called sami where there happened to be a market and a number of people assembled in an open place in the middle of the town selling cattle cloth corn etc i rode through the midst of them without being much observed every one taking me for a moor in the afternoon i arrived at a small village called beanie where i agreed with the duty's son for one hundred cowries to allow me to stay for the night but when the duty returned he insisted that i should instantly leave the place and if his wife and son had not interceded for me i must have complied august fifteenth about nine o'clock i passed a large town called say which very much excited my curiosity it is completely surrounded by two very deep trenches at about two hundred yards distant from the walls on top of the trenches are a number of square towers and the whole has the appearance of a regular fortification 
about noon i came to the village of kamu situated upon the bank of the river and as the corn i had purchased at sibley was exhausted i endeavored to purchase a fresh supply but was informed that corn was become very scarce all over the country and though i offered fifty cowries for a small quantity no person would sell me any as i was about to depart however one of the villagers who probably mistook me for some morris sherif brought me some as a present only desiring me to bestow my blessing upon him which i did in plain english and he received it with a thousand acknowledgments of this present i made my dinner and it was the third successive day that i had subsisted entirely upon rock corn in the evening i arrived at a small village called song the surely inhabitants of which would not receive me nor so much as permit me to enter the gate but as lions were very numerous in the neighborhood and i had frequently in the course of the day observed the impression of their feet on the road i resolved to stay in the vicinity of the village having collected some grass for my horse i accordingly lay down under a tree by the gate about ten o'clock i heard the hollow roar of a lion at no great distance and attempted to open the gate but the people from within told me that no person must attempt to enter the gate without the duty's permission i begged them to inform the duty that a lion was approaching the village and i hoped he would allow me to come within the gate i waited for an answer to this message with great anxiety for the lion kept prowling round the village and once advanced so very near me that i heard him rustling among the grass and climbed the tree for safety about midnight the duty with some of his people opened the gate and desired me to come in they were convinced they said that i was not a moor for no moor ever waited any time at the gate of a village without cursing the inhabitants august sixteenth about ten o'clock i passed a considerable town with a mosque called jabi here the country begins to rise into hills and i could see the summits of high mountains to the westward about noon i stopped at a small village near yamina where i purchased some corn and dried my papers and clothes the town of yamina at a distance has a very fine appearance it covers nearly the same extent of ground as san sing but having been plundered by daisy king of Karta, about four years ago it has not yet resumed its former prosperity nearly one half of the town being nothing but a heap of ruins however it is still a considerable place and it is so much frequented by the moors that i did not think it safe to lodge in it but in order to satisfy myself respecting its population and extent i resolved to ride through it in doing which i observed a great many moors sitting upon the bentangs and other places of public resort everybody looked at me with astonishment but as i rode briskly along they had no time to ask questions i arrived in the evening at fara a walled village where without much difficulty i procured a lodging for the night august seventeenth early in the morning i pursued my journey and at eight o'clock passed a considerable town called bal abba after which the road quits the plain and stretches along the side of the hill i passed in the same course of this day the ruins of three towns the inhabitants of which were all carried away by daisy king of Karta on the same day that he took and plundered yamina near one of those ruins i claimed a terramin tree but found the fruit quite green and sour and the prospect of the country was by no means inviting 
for the high grass and bushes seemed completely to obstruct the road and the lowlands were all so flooded by the river that the niger had the appearance of an extensive lake in the evening i arrived at kanika where the duty who was sitting upon an elephant's hide at the gate received me kindly and gave me for supper some milk and meal which i considered as to a person in my situation it really was a very great luxury august eighteenth by mistake i took the wrong road and did not discover my error until i had travelled nearly four miles when coming to an eminence i observed the niger considerably to the left directing my course towards it i travelled through long grass and bushes with great difficulty until two o'clock in the afternoon when i came to a comparatively small but very rapid river which i took at first for a creek or one of the streams of the niger however after i had examined it with more attention i was convinced that it was a distinct river and as the road evidently crossed it for i could see the pathway on the opposite side i sat down upon the bank in hopes that some traveller might arrive who would give me the necessary information concerning the fording place for the banks were so covered with reeds and bushes that it would have been almost impossible to land on the other side except at the pathway which on account of the rapidity of the stream it seemed very difficult to reach no traveller however arriving and there being a great appearance of rain i examined the grass and bushes for some way up the bank and determined upon entering the river considerably above the pathway in order to reach the other side before the stream had swept me too far down with this view i fastened my clothes upon the saddle and was standing up to the neck in water pulling my horse by the bridle to make him follow me when a man came accidentally to the place and seeing me in the water called to me with great vehemence to come out the alligators he said would devour both me and my horse if we attempted to swim over when i had got out the stranger who had never before seen a european seemed wonderfully surprised he twice put his hand to his mouth exclaiming in a low tone of voice god preserve me who is this but when he heard me speak the bambara tongue and found that i was going the same way as himself he promised to assist me in crossing the river the name of which he said was frina he then went a little way along the bank and called to some person who answered from the other side in a short time a canoe with two boys came paddling from among the reeds these boys agreed for fifty cowries to transport me and my horse over the river which was effected without much difficulty and i arrived in the evening at tafra a walled town and soon discovered that the language of the natives was improved from the corrupted dialect of bambara to the pure mandingo volume two chapter eighteen despairing thoughts arrival at sibi dulu on my arrival at tafra i inquired for the duty but was informed that he had died a few days before my arrival and that there was at that moment a meeting of the chief men for electing another there being some dispute about the succession it was probably owing to this unsettled state of the town that i experienced such a want of hospitality in it for though i informed the inhabitants that i should only remain with them for one night and assured them that mansong had given me some cowries to pay for my lodging yet no person invited me to come in and i was forced to sit alone under the benteng tree 
exposed to the rain and wind of a tornado which lasted with great violence until midnight at this time the stranger who had assisted me in crossing the river paid me a visit and observing that i had not found a lodging invited me to take part of his supper which he had brought to the door of his hut for being a guest himself he could not without his landlord's consent invite me to come in after this i slept upon some wet grass in the corner of a court my horse fared still worse than myself the corn i purchased being all expended and i could not procure a supply august twentieth i passed the town of jabba and stopped a few minutes at a village called somino where i begged and obtained some coarse food which the natives prepare from the husks of corn and call boo about two o'clock i came to the village of suha and endeavoured to purchase some corn from the duty who was sitting by the gate but without success i then requested a little food by way of charity but was told he had none to spare whilst i was examining the countenance of this inhospitable old man and endeavouring to find out the cause of the sullen discontent which was visible in his eye he called to a slave who was working in the cornfield at a little distance and ordered him to bring his hoe along with him the duty then told him to dig a hole in the ground pointing to a spot at no great distance the slave with his hoe began to dig a pit in the earth and the duty who appeared to be a man of very fretful disposition kept muttering and talking to himself until the pit was almost finished when he repeatedly pronounced the words danaku good for nothing jankra lemon a real plague which expressions i thought could be applied to nobody but myself and as the pit had very much the appearance of a grave i thought it prudent to mount my horse and was about to decamp when the slave who had before gone into the village to my surprise returned with the corpse of a boy about nine or ten years of age quite naked the negro carried the boy by a leg and an arm and threw it into the pit with a savage indifference which i had never before seen as he covered the body with earth the duty often expressed himself napula attain inata money lost whence i concluded that the boy had been one of his slaves departing from this shocking scene i travelled by the side of the river until sunset when i came to kulikoru a considerable town and a great market for salt here i took up my lodging at the house of a bambaran who had formerly been the slave of a moor and in the character had travelled to aron taudini and many other places in the great desert but turning mussulman and his master dying at jenne he obtained his freedom and settled at this place where he carries on a considerable trade in salt cotton cloth etc his knowledge of the world had not lessened that superstitious confidence in safis and charms which he had imbibed in his earlier years for when he heard that i was a christian he immediately thought of procuring a safi and for this purpose brought out his waha or writing board assuring me that he would dress me a supper of rice if i would write him a safi to protect him from wicked men the proposal was of too great consequence to me to be refused i therefore wrote the board full from top to bottom on both sides and my landlord 
to be certain of having the whole force of the charm wash the writing from the board in a calabash with a little water and having said a few prayers over it drank this powerful draught after which lest a single word should escape he licked the board until it was quite dry a saffy writer was a man of too great consequence to be long concealed the important information was carried to the duty who sent his son with half a sheet of writing paper desiring me to write a napula safi a charm to procure wealth he brought me as a present some meal and milk and when i had finished the safi and read it to him with an audible voice he seemed highly satisfied with his bargain and promised to bring me in the morning some milk for my breakfast when i had finished my supper of rice and salt i laid myself down upon a bullock's hide and slept very quietly until morning this being the first good meal and refreshing sleep that i had enjoyed for a long time august twenty first at daybreak i departed from kulikoru and about noon passed the villages of kayu and tulumbo in the afternoon i arrived at marabu a large town and like kulikoro famous for its trade in salt i was conducted to the house of a kartan of the tribe of jawar by whom i was well received this man had acquired a considerable property in the slave trade and from his hospitality to strangers was called by way of pre-eminence jati the landlord and his house was sort of public inn for all travellers those who had money were well lodged for they always made him some return for his kindness but those who had nothing to give were content to accept whatever he thought proper and as i could not rank myself among the moneyed men i was happy to take up my lodging in the same but with seven poor fellows who had come from kankaba in a canoe but our landlord sent us some victuals august twenty second one of the landlord's servants went with me a little way from the town to show me what road to take but whether from ignorance or design i know not he directed me wrong and i did not discover my mistake until the day was far advanced when coming to a deep creek i had some thoughts of turning back but as by that means i foresaw that i could not possibly reach bamaku before night i resolved to cross it and leading my horse close to the brink i went behind him and pushed him headlong into the water and then taking the bridle in my teeth swam over to the other side about four o'clock in the afternoon having altered my course from the river towards the mountains i came to a small pathway which led to a village called frukabu where i slept august twenty third early in the morning i set out for bamaku at which place i arrived about five o'clock in the afternoon i had heard bamaku much talked of as a great market for salt and i felt rather disappointed to find it only a middling town not quite so large as marabou however the smallness of its size is more than compensated by the richness of its inhabitants for when the moors bring their salt through carta or bambara they constantly rest a few days at this place and the negro merchants here who are well acquainted with the value of salt in different kingdoms frequently purchase by wholesale and retail it to great advantage here i lodged at the house of a surawoli negro and was visited by a number of moors they spoke very good mandingo 
and were more civil to me than their countrymen had been one of them had travelled to rio grande and spoke very highly of the christians he sent me in the evening some boiled rice and milk i now endeavoured to procure information concerning my route to the westward from a slave merchant who had resided some years on the gambia he gave me some imperfect account of the distance and enumerated the names of great many places that lay in the way but with hell told me that the road was impassable at this season of the year he was even afraid he said that i should find great difficulty in proceeding any farther as the road crossed the joliba at a town about a half day's journey to the westward of bamaku and there being no canoes at that place large enough to receive my horse i could not possibly get over for some months to come this was an obstruction of very serious nature but as i had no money to maintain myself even for a few days i resolved to push on and if i could not convey my horse across the river to abandon him and swim over myself in thoughts of this nature i passed the night and in the morning consulted with my landlord how i should surmount the present difficulty he informed me that one road still remained which was indeed very rocky and scarcely passable for horses but that if i had a proper guide over the hills to a town called Sibidulu, he had no doubt but with patience and caution i might travel forwards through manding i immediately applied to the duty and was informed that a jili kia singing man was about to depart for Sibidulu and would show me the road over the hills with this man who undertook to be my conductor i travelled up a rocky glen about two miles when we came to a small village and here my musical fellow-traveller found out that he had brought me the wrong road he told me that the horse road lay on the other side of the hill and throwing his drum on his back mounted up the rocks where indeed no horse could follow him leaving me to admire his agility and trace out a road for myself as i found it impossible to proceed i rode back to the level ground and directing my course to the eastward came about noon to another glen and discovered a path on which i observed the marks of horses feet following this path i came in a short time to some shepherds huts where i was informed that i was on the right road but that i could not possibly reach sibi adulu before night a little before sunset i descended on the northwest side of this ridge of hills and as i was looking about for a convenient tree under which to pass the night for i had no hopes of reaching any town i descended into a delightful valley and soon afterwards arrived at a romantic village called kuma this village is surrounded by a high wall and is the sole property of a mandingo merchant who fled hither with his family during a former war the adjacent fields yield him plenty of corn his cattle roam at large in the valley and the rocky hills secure him from the depredations of war in this obscure retreat he is seldom visited by strangers but whenever this happens he makes the weary traveller welcome i soon found myself surrounded by a circle of the harmless villagers they asked a thousand questions about my country and in return for my information brought corn and milk for myself and grass for my horse kindled a fire in a hut where i was to sleep and appeared very anxious to serve me august twenty fifth i departed from kuma 
accompanied by two shepherds who were going towards sibi dulu the road was very steep and rocky and as my horse had hurt his feet much in coming from bambaku he travelled slowly and with great difficulty for in many places the ascent was so sharp and the declivities so great that if he made one false step he must inevitably have been dashed to pieces the shepherds being anxious to proceed gave themselves little trouble about me or my horse and kept walking on at a considerable distance it was about eleven o'clock as i stopped to drink a little water at a rivulet my companions being near a quarter of a mile before me that i heard some people calling to each other and presently a loud screaming as from a person in great distress i immediately conjectured that a lion had taken one of the shepherds and mounted my horse to have a better view of what had happened the noise however ceased and i rode slowly towards the place from whence i thought it had proceeded calling out but without receiving an answer in a little time however i perceived one of the shepherds lying among the long grass near the road and thought i could see no blood upon him i concluded he was dead but when i came close to him he whispered to me to stop telling me that a party of armed men had seized upon his companion and shot two arrows at himself as he was making his escape i stopped to consider what course to take and looking round saw at a little distance a man sitting upon a stump of a tree i distinguished also the heads of six or seven more sitting among the grass with muskets in their hands i had now no hopes of escaping and therefore determined to ride forward towards them as i approached them i was in hopes they were elephant hunters and by way of opening the conversation i inquired if they had shot anything but without returning an answer one of them ordered me to dismount and then as if recollecting himself waved with his hand for me to proceed i accordingly rode past and had with some difficulty crossed a deep rivulet when i heard somebody hola and looking behind saw those i had taken for elephant hunters running after me and calling out to me to turn back i stopped until they were all come up when they informed me that the king of the fulas had sent them on purpose to bring me my horse and everything that belonged to me to fuladu and that therefore i must turn back and go along with them without hesitating a moment i turned round and followed them and we travelled together nearly a quarter of a mile without exchanging a word when coming to a dark place in a wood one of them said in a mandingo language this place will do and immediately snatched my hat from my head though i was by no means free of apprehension yet i resolved to show as few signs of fear as possible and therefore told them that unless my hat was returned to me i should proceed no farther but before i had time to receive an answer another drew his knife and seizing upon a metal button which remained upon my waistcoat cut it off and put it into his pocket their intentions were obvious and i thought that the easier they were permitted to rob me of everything the less i had to fear i therefore allowed them to search my pockets without resistance and examine every part of my apparel which they did with the most scrupulous exactness but observing that i had one waistcoat under another they insisted that i should cast them both off 
and at last to make sure work they stripped me quite naked even my half boots though the sole of one of them was tied on to my foot with a broken bridle rein were minutely inspected whilst they were examining the plunder i begged them with great earnestness to return my pocket compass but when i pointed it out to them as i was lying on the ground one of the banditti thinking i was about to take it up cocked his musket and swore that he would lay me dead upon the spot if i presumed to put my hand upon it after this some of them went away with my horse and the remainder stood considering whether they should leave me quite naked or allow me something to shelter me from the sun humanity at last prevailed they returned me the worst of the two shirts and a pair of trousers and as they went away one of them threw back my hat in the crown of which i kept my memorandums and this was probably the reason they did not wish to keep it after they were gone i sat for some time looking round me with amazement and terror whichever way i turned nothing appeared but danger and difficulty i saw myself in the midst of a vast wilderness in the depth of the rainy season naked and alone surrounded by savage animals and men still more savage i was five hundred miles from the nearest european settlement all these circumstances crowded at once on my recollection and i confess that my spirits began to fail me i considered my fate as certain and that i had no alternative but to lie down and perish the influence of religion however aided and supported me i reflected that no human prudence or foresight could possibly have averted my present sufferings i was indeed a stranger in a strange land yet i was still under the protecting eye of that providence who has con condescended to call himself the stranger's friend at this moment painful as my recollections were the extraordinary beauty of a small moss in fructification irresistibly caught my eye i mention this to show from what trifling circumstances the mind will sometimes derive consolation for though the whole plant was not larger than the top of one of my fingers I could not contemplate the delicate conformation of its roots leaves and capsula without admiration can that being thought i who planted watered and brought to perfection in this obscure part of the world a thing which appears of so small importance look within uncertain upon the situation and sufferings of creatures formed after his own image surely not reflections like these would not allow me to despair i started up and disregarding both hunger and fatigue travelled forwards assured that relief was at hand and i was not disappointed in a short time i came to a small village at the entrance of which i overtook the two shepherds who had come with me from kuma they were much surprised to see me for they said they never doubted that the fulas when they had robbed had murdered me departing from the village we travelled over several rocky ridges and at sunset arrived at sibidulu the frontier town of the kingdom of manding end of volume two chapter eighteen volume two chapter nineteen of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this librivox recording is in the public domain illness at kamalia 
and kindness of the natives the town of sibi du lu is situated in a fertile valley surrounded with high rocky hills it is scarcely accessible for horses and during the frequent wars between the bambarans fulas and mandingos has never once been plundered by an enemy when i entered the town the people gathered round me and followed me into the balloon where i was presented to the duty or chief man who is here called mansa which usually signifies king nevertheless it appeared to me that the government of manding was a sort of republic or rather an oligarchy every town having a particular mansa and the chief power of the state in the last resort being lodged in the assembly of the whole body i related to the mansa the circumstances of my having been robbed of my horse and apparel and my story was confirmed by the two shepherds he continued smoking his pipe all the time i was speaking but i had no sooner finished than taking his pipe from his mouth and tossing up the sleeve of his cloak with an indignant air sit down said he you shall have everything restored to you i have sworn it and then turning to an attendant give the white man said he a draught of water and with the first light of the morning go over the hills and inform the duty of bambaku that a poor white man the king of bambara's stranger has been robbed by the king of fuladu's people a little expected in my forlorn condition to meet with a man who could thus feel for my sufferings i heartily thanked the mansa for his kindness and accepted his invitation to remain with him until the return of the messenger i was conducted into a hut and had some victuals sent me but the crowd of people which assembled to see me all of whom commiserated my misfortunes and vented appreciations against the fulas prevented me from sleeping until past midnight two days i remained without hearing any intelligence of my horse or clothes and as there was at this time a great scarcity of provisions approaching even to famine all over this part of the country i was unwilling to trespass any farther on the mansa's generosity and begged permission to depart to the next village finding me very anxious to proceed he told me that i might go as far as a town called wanda where he hoped i would remain a few days until i heard some account of my horse etc i departed accordingly on the next morning the twenty eighth and stopped at some small villages for refreshment i was presented at one of them with a dish which i had never before seen it was composed of the blossoms or anthere of the maize stewed in milk and water it is eaten only in time of great scarcity on the thirtieth about noon i arrived at wanda a small town with a mosque and surrounded by a high wall the mansa who was a mohammedan acted in two capacities as chief magistrate of the town and schoolmaster to the children he kept his school in an open shed where i was desired to take up my lodging until some account should arrive from sibi du lu concerning my horse and clothes for though the horse was of little use to me yet the few clothes were essential the little raiment upon me could neither protect me from the sun by day nor the dews and mosquitoes by night indeed my shirt was not only worn thin like a piece of muslin but withal so very dirty that i was happy to embrace an opportunity of washing it which having done and spread it upon a bush 
i sat down naked in the shade until it was dry ever since the commencement of the rainy season my health had been greatly on the decline i had often been affected with slight paroxysms of fever and from the time of leaving bam aku the symptoms had considerably increased as i was sitting in the manner described the fever returned with such violence that it very alarmed me the more so as i had no medicine to stop its progress nor any hope of obtaining that care and attention which my situation required i remained at wanda nine days during which time i experienced the regular return of the fever every day and though i endeavoured as much as possible to conceal my distress from my landlord and frequently lay down the whole day out of his sight in a field of corn conscious how burdensome i was to him and his family in a time of such great scarcity yet i found that he was apprised of my situation and one morning as i feigned to be asleep by the fire he observed to his wife that they were likely to find me a very troublesome and chargeable guest for that in my present sickly state they should be obliged for the sake of their good name to maintain me until i recovered or died the scarcity of provisions was certainly felt at the time most severely by the poor people as the following circumstance most painfully convinced me every evening during my stay i observed five or six women come to the mansa's house and receive each of them a certain quantity of corn as i knew how valuable this article was at this juncture i inquired of the mansa whether he maintained these poor women from pure bounty or expected a return when the harvest should be gathered in observe that boy said he pointing to a fine child about five years of age his mother has sold him to me for forty days provision for herself and the rest of her family i have bought another boy in the same manner good god thought i what must a mother suffer before she sells her own child i could not get this melancholy subject out of my mind and the next night when the women returned for their allowance i desired the boy to point out to me his mother which he did she was much emaciated but had nothing cruel or savage in her countenance and when she had received her corn she came and talked to her son with as much cheerfulness as if he had still been under her care september six two people arrived from sibadulu bringing with them my horse and clothes but i found that my pocket compass was broken to pieces this was a great loss which i could not repair september seventh as my horse was grazing near the brink of a well the ground gave way and fell in the well was about ten feet in diameter and so very deep that when i saw my horse snorting in the water i thought it was impossible to save him the inhabitants of the village however immediately assembled and having tied together a number of weeds footnote from a plant called kaba that climbs like a vine upon the tree End footnote. they lowered a man down into the well who fastened those weeds round the body of the horse and the people having first drawn up the man took hold of the weeds and to my surprise pulled the horse out with the greatest facility the poor animal was now reduced to a mere skeleton and the roads were scarcely passable being either very rocky or else full of mud and water i therefore found it impractical to travel with him any farther and was happy to leave him in the hands of one who i thought would take care of him i accordingly presented him to my landlord and desired him to send my saddle and bridle 
as a present to the mansa of sibi dulu being the only return i could make him for having taken so much trouble in procuring my horse and clothes i now thought it necessary sick as i was to take leave of my hospitable landlord on the morning of september eighth when i was about to depart he presented me with his spear as a token of remembrance and a leather bag to contain my clothes having converted my half boots into sandals i travelled with more ease and slept that night at a village called balanti on the ninth i reached nemaku but the mansa of the village thought fit to make me sup upon the chameleon's dish by way of apology however he assured me the next morning that the scarcity of corn was such that he could not possibly allow me any i could not accuse him of unkindness as all the people actually appeared to be starving september tenth it rained hard all day and the people kept themselves in their huts in the afternoon i was visited by a negro named modi lamina tora a great trader who suspected my distress brought me some victuals and promised to conduct me to his own house at kinyato the day following september eleventh i departed from nemaku and arrived at kinyato in the evening but having hurt my ankle in the way it swelled and inflamed so much that i could neither walk nor set my foot to the ground the next day without great pain my landlord observing this kindly invited me to stop with him a few days and i accordingly remained at his house until the fourteenth by which i felt much relieved and could walk with the help of staff i now set out thanking my landlord for his great care and attention and being accompanied by a young man who was travelling the same way i proceeded for jerry jang a beautiful and well cultivated district the mansa of which is reckoned the most powerful chief of any in manding on the fifteenth i reached dosita a large town where i stayed one day on account of the rain but i continued very sickly and was slightly delirious in the night on the seventeenth i set out for mansia a considerable town where small quantities of gold are collected the road led over a high rocky hill and my strength and spirits were so much exhausted that before i could reach the top of the hill i was forced to lie down three times being very faint and sickly i reached mansia in the afternoon the mansa of this town had the character of being very inhospitable he however sent me a little corn for my supper but demanded something in return and when i assured him that i had nothing of value in my possession he told me as if in jest that my white skin should not defend me if i told him lies he then showed me the hut wherein i was to sleep but took away my spear saying that it should be returned to me in the morning this trifling circumstance when joined to the character i had heard of the man made me rather suspicious of him and i privately desired one of the inhabitants of the place who had a bow and quiver to sleep in the same hut with me about midnight i heard somebody approach the door and observing the moonlight strike suddenly into the hut i started up and saw a man stepping cautiously over the threshold i immediately snatched up the negro's bow and quiver the rattling of which made the man withdraw and my companion looking out assured me that it was the mansa himself and advised me to keep awake until the morning i closed the door and placed a large piece of wood behind it and was wondering at this unexpected visit 
when somebody pressed so hard against the door that the negro could scarcely keep it shut but when i called to him to open the door the intruder ran off as before september sixteenth as soon as it was light the negro at my request went to the mansa's house and brought away my spear he told me that the mansa was asleep and lest this inhospitable chief should devise means to detain me he advised me to set out before he was awake which i immediately did and about two o'clock reached Kamalia, a small town situated at the bottom of some rocky hills where the inhabitants collect gold in considerable quantities on my arrival at Kamalia, i was conducted to the house of the bushreen named karfa tower the brother of him to whose hospitality i was indebted at kinikeo he was collecting a coffle of slaves with a view to sell them to the europeans on the gambia as soon as the rain should be over i found him sitting in his balloon surrounded by several slatees who proposed to join the coffle he was reading to them from an arabic book and inquired with a smile if i understood it being answered in the negative he desired one of the slatees to fetch the little curious book which had been brought from the west country on opening the small volume i was surprised and delighted to find it our book of common prayer and karfa expressed great joy to hear that i could read it for some of the slatees who had seen the europeans upon the coast observing the color of my skin which was now become very yellow from sickness my long beard ragged clothes and extreme poverty were unwilling to admit that i was a white man and told karfa that they suspected i was some arab in disguise karfa however perceiving that i could read this book had no doubt concerning me and kindly promised me every assistance in his power at the same time he informed me that it was impossible to cross the jalonka wilderness for many months yet to come as no less than eight rapid rivers he said lay in the way he added that he intended to set out himself for gambia as soon as the rivers were fordable and the grass burnt and advised me to stay and accompany him he remarked that when a caravan of the natives could not travel through the country it was idle for a single white man to attempt it i readily admitted that such an attempt was an act of rashness but i assured him that i had no alternative for having no money to support myself i must either beg my subsistence by travelling from place to place or perish for want karfa now looked at me with great earnestness and inquired if i could eat the common victuals of the country assuring me that he had never before seen a white man he added that if i would remain with him until the rains were over he would give me plenty of victuals in the meantime and a hut to sleep in and that after he had conducted me in safety to the gambia i might then make him what return i thought proper i asked him if the value of one prime slave would satisfy him he answered in the affirmative and immediately ordered one of the huts to be swept for my accommodation thus i was delivered by the friendly care of this benevolent negro from a situation truly deplorable distress and famine pressed hard on me i had before me the gloomy wilds of jalon Cado, where the traveller sees no habitation for five successive days i had observed at a distance the rapid course of the river koro i had almost marked out the place where i was doomed i thought to perish when this friendly negro stretched out his hospitable hand 
for my relief in the hut which was appropriated for me i was provided with a mat to sleep on an earthen jar for holding water and a small calabash to drink out of and carfa sent me from his own dwelling two meals a day and ordered his slaves to supply me with firewood and water but i found that neither the kindness of carfa nor any sort of accommodation could put a stop to the fever which weakened me and which became every day more alarming i endeavoured as much as possible to conceal my distress but on the third day after my arrival as i was going with carfa to visit some of his friends i found myself so faint that i could scarcely walk and before we reached the place i staggered and fell into a pit from which the clay had been taken to build one of the huts carfa endeavoured to console me with the hopes of a speedy recovery assuring me that if i would not walk out in the wet i should soon be well i determined to follow his advice and confine myself to my hut but was still tormented with the fever and my health continued to be in a very precarious state for five ensuing weeks sometimes i would crawl out of the hut and sit a few hours in the open air at other times i was unable to rise and pass the lingering hours in a very gloomy and solitary manner i was seldom visited by any person except my benevolent landlord who came daily to inquire after my health when the rains became less frequent and the country began to grow dry the fever left me but in so debilitated a condition that i could scarcely stand upright and it was with great difficulty that i could carry my mat to the shade of a tamarind tree a short distance to enjoy the refreshing smell of the cornfields and delight my eyes with a prospect of the country i had the pleasure at length to find myself in a state of convalescence towards which the benevolent and simple manners of the negroes and the perusal of carfe's little volume greatly contributed in the meantime many of the slatees who reside at camilla having spent all their money and become in a great measure dependent upon carfa's hospitality beheld me with an eye of envy and invented many ridiculous and trifling stories to lessen me in carfa's esteem and in the beginning of december a surah woolly slatee with five slaves arrived from sego this man too spread a number of malicious reports concerning me but carfa paid no attention to them and continued to show me the same kindness as formerly as i was one day conversing with the slaves which this slatee had brought one of them begged me to give him some victuals i told him i was a stranger and had none to give he replied i gave you victuals when you were hungry have you forgot the man who brought you milk at caracancala but added he with a sigh the irons were not then upon my legs i immediately recollected him and begged some ground nuts from carfa to give him as a return for his former kindness in the beginning of december carfa proposed to complete his purchase of slaves and for this purpose collected all the debts which were owing to him in his own country and on the nineteenth being accompanied by three slatees he departed for kankaba a large town on the banks of the niger and a great slave market most of the slaves who are sold at kankaba come from bambara for my song to avoid the expense and danger of keeping all his prisoners at sego commonly sends them in small parties to be sold at the different trading towns and as kankaba is much resorted to by merchants it is always well supplied with slaves which are sent thither up the niger in canoes 
when Carfa departed from Camilla, he proposed to return in the course of a month, and during his absence I was left to the care of a good old Bushreen, who acted as schoolmaster to the young people of Camilla. End of Volume 2, Chapter 19volume two chapter twenty of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this librivox recording is in the public domain negro customs the whole of my route both in going and returning having been confined to a tract of country bounded nearly by the twelfth and fifteenth parallels of latitude the reader must imagine that i found the climate in most places extremely hot but nowhere did i feel the heat so intense and oppressive as in the camp at benaum of which mention has been made in a former place in some parts where the country ascends into hills the air is at all times comparatively cool yet none of the districts which i traversed could properly be called mountainous about the middle of june the hot and sultry atmosphere is agitated by violent gusts of wind called tornadoes accompanied with thunder and rain these usher in what is denominated the rainy season which continues until the month of november during this time the dinural rains are very heavy and the prevailing winds are from the southwest the termination of the rainy season is likewise attended with violent tornadoes after which the wind shifts to the northeast and continues to blow from that quarter during the rest of the year when the wind sets in from the northeast it produces a wonderful change in the face of the country the grass soon becomes dry and withered the rivers subside very rapidly and many of the trees shed their leaves about this period is commonly felt the harmattan a dry and parching wind blows from the northeast and accompanied by a thick smoking haze through which the sun appears of a dull red color this wind in passing over the great desert of sahara acquires a very strong attraction for humidity and parches up everything exposed to its current it is however reckoned very salutary particularly to europeans who generally recover their health during its continents i experienced immediate relief from sickness both at dr ladley's and at camilla during the harmattan indeed the air during the rainy season is so loaded with moisture that clothes shoes trunks and everything that is not close to the fire becomes damp and mouldy and the inhabitants may be said to live in a sort of vapor bath but this dry wind braces up the solids which were before relaxed gives a cheerful flow of spirits and is even pleasant to respiration its ill effects are that it produces chaps in the lips and afflicts many of the natives with sore eyes whenever the grass is sufficiently dry the negroes set it on fire but in lut amar and other moorish countries this practice is not allowed for it is upon the withered stubble that the moors feed their cattle until the return of the rains the burning the grass in manding exhibits a scene of terrific grandeur in the middle of the night i could see the plains and mountains as far as my eye could reach variegated with lines of fire and the light reflected on the sky made the heavens appear in a blaze in the daytime pillars of smoke were seen in every direction while the birds of prey were observed hovering round the conflagration and pouncing down upon the snakes lizards and other reptiles which attempted to escape from the flames this annual burning is soon followed by a fresh and sweet verdure 
and the country is thereby rendered more healthful and pleasant of the most remarkable and important of the vegetable productions mentioned has already been made and they are nearly the same in all districts through which i passed it is observable however that although many species of the edible roots which grow in the west india islands are found in africa yet i never saw in any part of my journey either the sugar-cane the coffee or the coca tree nor could i learn on inquiry that they were known to the natives the pineapple and the thousand other delicious fruits which the industry of civilized man improving the bounties of nature has brought to so great perfection in the tropical climates of america here are equally unknown i observed indeed a few orange and banana trees near the mouth of the gambia but whether they were indigenous or were formerly planted there by some of the white traders i could not positively learn i suspect that they were originally introduced by the portuguese concerning property in the soil it appeared to me that the lands in native woods were considered as belonging to the king or where the government was not monarchical to the state when any individual of free condition had the means of cultivating more land than he actually possessed he applied to the chief man of the district who allowed him an extension of territory on condition of forfeiture if the lands were not brought into cultivation by a given period the condition being fulfilled the soil became vested in the processor and for aught that appeared to me descended his heirs the population however considering the extent and fertility of the soil and the ease with which lands are obtained it is not very great in the countries which i visited i found many extensive and beautiful districts entirely destitute of inhabitants and in general the borders of the different kingdoms were either very thinly peopled or entirely deserted many places are likewise unfavorable to population from being unhealthful the swampy banks of the gambia the senegal and other rivers towards the coast are of this description perhaps it is on this account chiefly that the interior countries abound more with inhabitants than the maritime districts for all the negro nations that fell under my observation though divided in a number of petty independent states subexist chiefly by the same means live nearly in the same temperature and possess a wonderful similarity of disposition the mendigos in particular are a very gentle race cheerful in their dispositions inquisitive credulous simple and fond of flattery perhaps the most prominent defect in their character was that insurmountable propensity which the reader must have observed to prevail in all classes of them to steal from me the few effects i was possessed of for this part of their conduct no complete justification can be offered because theft is a crime in their own estimation and it must be observed that they are not habitually and generally guilty of it towards each other on the other hand as some counterbalance to this depravity in their nature allowing it to be such it is impossible for me to forget the disinterested charity and tender solicitude with which many of these poor heathens from the sovereign of sago to the poor women who received me at different times into their cottages when i was perishing of hunger sympathized with me in my sufferings relieved my distresses and contributed to my safety this acknowledgment however is perhaps more particularly due to the female part of the nation among the men as the reader must have seen my reception though generally kind was sometimes otherwise 
it varied according to the various tempers of those to whom i made application the hardness of advice in some and the blindness of bigotry in others had closed up the avenues to compassion but i do not recollect a single instant of hard heartedness towards me in the women in all my wanderings and wretchedness i found them uniformly kind and compassionate and i can truly say as my predecessor mr Leonard, had eloquently said before me to a woman i never address myself in the language of decency and friendship without receiving a decent and friendly answer if i was hungry or thirsty wet or sick they did not hesitate like the men to perform a generous action in so free and so kind a manner did they contribute to my relief that if i was dry i drank the sweetest draught and if hungry i ate the coarsest morsel with a double relish it is surely reasonable to suppose that the soft and amiable sympathy of nature which was thus spontaneously manifested toward me in my distress is displayed by these poor people as occasion requires much more strongly towards persons of their own nation and neighbourhood and especially when the objects of their compassion are endeared to them by the ties of consanguinity accordingly the maternal affection neither suppressed by the restraints nor diverted by the solicitudes of civilized life is everywhere conspicuous among them and creates a correspondent return of tenderness in the child an illustration of this has been already given strike me said my attendant but do not curse my mother the same sentiment i found universally to prevail and observed in all parts of africa that the greatest affront which could be offered to a negro was to reflect on her who gave him birth it is not strange that this sense of filial duty and affection among the negroes should be less ardent towards the father than the mother the system of polygamy while it weakens the father's attachment by dividing it among the children of different wives concentrates all the mother's jealous tenderness to one point the protection of her own offspring i perceive with great satisfaction too that the maternal solicitude extended not only to the growth and security of the person but also in a certain degree to the improvement of the mind of the infant for one of the first lessons in which the mandingo women instruct their children is the practice of truth the reader will probably recollect the case of the unhappy mother whose son was murdered by the moorish banditti at funning Keddie. her only consolation in her uttermost distress was the reflection that the poor boy in the course of his blameless life had never told a lie such testimony from a fond mother on such an occasion must have operated powerfully on the youthful part of the surrounding spectators it was at once a tribute of praise to the deceased and a lesson to the living the negro women suckle their children until they are able to walk of themselves three years nursing is not uncommon and during this period the husband devotes his whole attention to his other wives to this practice it is owing i presume that the family of each wife is seldom very numerous few women have more than five or six children as soon as an infant is able to walk it is permitted to run about with great freedom the mother is not over solicitous to preserve it from slight falls and other trifling accidents a little practice soon enables a child to take care of itself and experience acts the part of a nurse as they advance in life the girls are taught to spin cotton and to beat corn and are instructed in other domestic duties 
and the boys are employed in the labors of the field both sexes whether bushreens or kaffirs on attaining the age of puberty are circumcised this painful operation is not considered by the kaffirs so much in the light of a religious ceremony as a matter of convenience and utility they have indeed a superstitious notion that it contributes to render the marriage state prolific the operation is performed upon several young people at the same time all of whom are exempted from every sort of labor for two months afterwards during this period they form a society called solimana they visit the towns and villages in the neighborhood where they dance and sing and are well treated by the inhabitants i have frequently in the course of my journey observed parties of this description but they were all males i had however an opportunity of seeing a female solimana at camalia in the course of this celebration it frequently happens that some of the young women get married if a man takes a fancy to any one of them it is not considered as absolutely necessary that he should make an overture to the girl herself the first object is to agree with the parents concerning the recompense to be given them for the loss of the company and services of their daughter the value of two slaves is a common price unless the girl is thought very handsome in which case the parents will raise their demand very considerably if the lover is rich enough and willing to give the sum demanded he then communicate his wishes to the damsel but her consent is by no means necessary to the match for if the parents agree to it and eat a few cola nuts which are represented by the suitor as an earnest of the bargain the young lady must either have the man of their choice or continue unmarried for she cannot afterwards be given to another if the parents should attempt it the lover is then authorized by the laws of the country to seize upon the girl as his slave when the day for celebrating the nuptials is fixed on a select number of people are invited to be present at the wedding a bullock or goat is killed and great plenty of victuals is dressed for the occasion as soon as it is dark the bride is conducted into a hut where a company of matrons assist in arranging the wedding dress which is always white cotton and is put on in such a manner as to conceal the bride from head to foot thus arrayed she is seated upon a mat in the middle of the floor and the old women place themselves in a circle round her they then give her a series of instructions and point out with great propriety what ought to be her future conduct in life this scene of instruction however is frequently interrupted by girls who amuse the company with songs and dances which are rather more remarkable for their gaiety than delicacy while the bride remains within the hut with the women the bridegroom devotes his attention to the guests of both sexes who assemble without doors and by distributing among them small presents of cola nuts and seeing that every one partakes of the good cheer which is provided he contributes much to the general hilarity of the evening when supper is ended the company spend the remainder of the night in singing and dancing and seldom separate until daybreak about midnight the bride is privately conducted by the women into the hut which is to be her future residence and the bridegroom upon a signal given retires from his company the negroes as hath been frequently observed whether mohammedan or pagan allow a plurality of wives though mohammedans alone are by their religion confined to four and as the husband commonly pays a great price for each 
he requires from all of them the utmost deference and submission and treats them more like hired servants than companions they have however the management of domestic affairs and each in rotation is mistress of the household and has the care of dressing the victuals overlooking the female slaves etc but though the african husbands are possessed of great authority over their wives i did not observe that in general they treat them with cruelty neither did i perceive that mean jealousy in their dispositions which is so prevalent among the moors they permit their wives to partake in all public diversions and this indulgence is seldom abused for though the negro women are very cheerful and frank in their behavior they are by no means given to intrigue i believe that instances of conjugal infidelity are not common when the wives quarrel among themselves a circumstance which from the nature of their situation must frequently happen the husband decides between them and sometimes finds it necessary to administer a little corporate chastisement before tranquillity can be restored but if any one of the ladies complains to the chief of the town that her husband has unjustly punished her and shown an undue partiality to some other of his wives the affair is brought to public trial in these palavers however which are conducted chiefly by married men i was informed that the complaint of the wife is not always considered in a very serious light and the complainant herself is sometimes convicted of strife and contention and left without remedy if she murmurs at the decision of the court the magic rod of mumbo jumbo soon puts an end to the business the children of mandingos are not always named after their relations but frequently in consequence of some remarkable occurrence thus my landlord at camilla was called carfa a word signifying to replace because he was born shortly after the death of one of his brothers other names are descriptive of good or bad qualities as modi a good man fada biba father of the town etc indeed the very names of their towns have something descriptive in them as sibi du lu the town of sibola trees keni yato victuals here dosita lift your spoon others appear to be given by way of reproach as bamaku wash a crocodile kara can kala no cup to drink from etc a child is named when it is seven or eight days old the ceremony commences by shaving the infant's head and a dish called dega made of pounded corn and sour milk is prepared for the guests if the parents are rich a sheep or goat is commonly added the feast is called ding coon li the child's head shaving during my stay at camilla i was present at four different feasts of this kind and the ceremony was the same in each whether the child belonged to a bashreen or kaffir the schoolmaster who officiated as priest on these occasions and who is necessarily a bashreen first said a long prayer over the diga during which every person present took hold of the brim of the calabash with his right hand after this the schoolmaster took the child in his arms and said a second prayer in which he repeatedly solicited the blessing of god upon the child and upon all the company when this prayer was ended he whispered a few sentences in the child's ear and spat three times in its face after which he pronounced its name out loud and returned the infant to the mother footnote soon after baptism the children are marked in different parts of the skin 
in a manner resembling what is called tattooing in the south sea islands End footnote. this part of the ceremony being ended the father of the child divided the dega into a number of balls one of which he distributed to every person present an inquiry was then made if any person in the town was dangerously sick it being usual in such cases to send the party a large portion of the dega which is thought to possess great medicinal virtues among the negroes every individual besides his own proper name has likewise a contong or surname to denote the family or clan to which he belongs some of these families are very numerous and powerful it is impossible to enumerate the various cantons which are found in different parts of the country though the knowledge of many of them is of great service to the traveller for as every negro plumes himself upon the importance or the antiquity of his clan he is much flattered when he is addressed by his contong salutations among the negroes to each other when they meet are always observed but those in most general use among the kaffirs are abi herito ening seni anawari etc all of which have nearly the same meaning and signify are you well or to that effect there are likewise salutations which are used at different times of the day as ening somo good morning etc the general answer to all salutations is to repeat the contong of the person who salutes or else to repeat the salutation itself first pronouncing the word marhaba my friend end of volume two chapter twenty volume two chapter twenty one of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this librivox recording is in the public domain religious beliefs and industries of the mandingos the mandingos and i believe the negroes in general have no artificial method of dividing time they calculate the years by the number of rainy seasons they portion the year into moons and reckon the days by so many suns the day they divide into morning midday and evening and farther subdivide it when necessary by pointing to the sun's place in the heavens i frequently inquired of some of them what became of the sun during the night and whether we should see the same sun or a different one in the morning but i found that they considered the question as very childish the subject appeared to them as placed beyond the reach of human investigation they had never indulged at conjecture nor formed any hypothesis about the matter the moon by varying her form has more attracted their attention on the first appearance of the new moon which they look upon to be newly created the pagan natives as well as the mohammedans say a short prayer and this seems to be the only visible adoration which the kaffirs offer up to the supreme being this prayer is pronounced in a whisper the party holding up his hands before his face its purport as i have been assured by many different people is to return thanks to god for his kindness through the existence of the past moon and to solicit a continuation of his favour during that of the new one at the conclusion they spit upon their hands and rub them over their faces this seems to be nearly the same ceremony which prevailed among the heathens in the days of job footnote chapter thirty one v v twenty six to twenty eight and footnote 
great attention however is paid to the changes of this luminary in its monthly course and it is thought very unlucky to begin a journey or any other work of consequence in the last quarter an eclipse whether of the sun or moon is supposed to be affected by witchcraft the stars are very little regarded and the whole study of astronomy appears to them as a useless pursuit and attended to by such persons only as deal in magic their notions of geography are equally puerile they imagine that the world is an extended plain the termination of which no eye has discovered it being they say overhung with clouds and darkness they describe the sea as a large river of salt water on the farther shore of which is situated a country called toba bo du the land of the white people at a distance from toba du du they describe another country which they allege as inhabited by cannibals of gigantic size called komi this country they called jong sang du the land where the slaves are sold but of all countries in the world their own appears to them as the best and their own people as the happiest and they pity the fate of other nations who have been placed by providence in less fertile and less fortunate districts some of the religious opinions of the negroes though blended with the weakest credulity and superstition are not unworthy attention i have conversed with all ranks and conditions upon the subject of their faith and can pronounce without the smallest shadow of doubt that the belief of one god and of future stake of reward and punishment its entire and universal among them it is remarkable however that except on the appearance of a new moon as before related the pagan natives do not think it necessary to offer up prayers and supplications to the almighty they represent the deity indeed as the creator and preserver of all things but in general they consider him as being so remote and of so exalted a nature that it is idle to imagine the feeble supplications of wretched mortals can reverse the decrees and change the purposes of unerring wisdom if they are asked for what reason then do they offer up a prayer on the appearance of a new moon the answer is that custom has made it necessary they do it because their fathers did it before them such is the blindness of unassisted nature the concerns of this world they believe are committed by the almighty to the superintendence and direction of subordinate spirits over whom they suppose that certain magical ceremonies have great influence a white fowl suspended to the branch of a particular tree a snake's head or a few handfuls of fruit are offerings which ignorance and superstition frequently present to depreciate the wrath or to conciliate the favor of these tutelary agents but it is not often that the negroes make their religious opinions the subject of conversation when interrogated in particular concerning their ideas of a future state they express themselves with great reverence but endeavor to shorten the discussion by observing mo o mo in ta alo no man knows anything about it they are content they say to follow the precepts and examples of their forefathers through the various vicissitudes of life and when this world presents no objects of enjoyment or of comfort they seem to look with anxiety toward another which they believe will be better suited to their natures 
but concerning which they are far from indulging vain and delusive conjectures the mandingos seldom attain extreme old age at forty most of them become gray-haired and covered with wrinkles and but few of them survive the age of fifty-five or sixty they calculate the years of their lives as i have already observed by the number of rainy seasons there being but one such in the year and distinguish each year by a particular name founded on some remarkable occurrence which happened that year thus they say the year of the farbana war the year of the carta war the year on which gado was plundered etc etc and i have no doubt that the year seventeen ninety six will in many places be distinguished by the name of tobano bu tami sang the year the white man passed as such an occurrence would naturally form an epoch in their traditional history but notwithstanding that longevity is uncommon among them it appeared to me that their diseases are but few in number their simple diet and active way of life preserve them from many of those disorders which embitter the days of luxury and idleness fevers and fluxes are the most common and the most fatal for these they gently apply saffies to different parts of the body and perform a great many other superstitious ceremonies some of which are indeed well calculated to inspire the patient with the hope of recovery and divert his mind from brooding over his own danger but i have sometimes observed among them a more systematic mode of treatment on the first attack of a fever when the patient complains of cold he is frequently placed in a sort of vapor bath this is done by spreading branches of the nacula orientalis upon hot wood embers and laying the patient upon them wrapped up in a large cotton cloth water is then sprinkled upon the branches which descending to the hot embers soon covers the patient with a cloud of vapor in which he is allowed to remain until the embers are almost extinguished this practice commonly produces a profuse perspiration and wonderfully relieves the sufferer for the dysentery they use the bark of different trees reduced to powder and mixed with the patient's food but this practice is in general very unsuccessful the other diseases which prevail among the negroes are the yaws the elephantitis and a leprosy of the very worst kind the last mentioned complaint appears at the beginning in scurfy spots upon different parts of the body which finally settle upon the hands or feet where the skin becomes withered and cracks in many places at length the ends of the fingers swell and ulcerate the discharge is acrid and fetid the nails drop off and the bones of the fingers become carious and separate at the joints in this manner the disease continues to spread frequently until the patient loses all his fingers and toes even the hands and feet are sometimes destroyed by this inverted malady to which the negroes give the name of bala au incurable the guinea worm is likewise very common in certain places especially at the commencement of the rainy season the negroes attribute this disease which has been described by many writers to bad water and allege that the people who drink from wells are more subject to it than those who drink from streams to the same cause they attribute the swelling of the glands of the neck goiters which are very common in some parts of bambara i observe also in the interior countries a few instances of simple gonorrhea but never the confirmed lose 
on the whole it appeared to me that the negroes are better surgeons than physicians i found them very successful in their management of fractures and dislocations and their splints and bandages are simple and easily removed the patient is laid upon a soft mat and the fractured limb is frequently bathed with cold water all abscesses they open with the actual cautery and the dressings are composed of either soft leaves shea butter or cow's dung as the case seems in their judgment to require towards the coast where a supply of european lancets can be procured they sometimes perform phlebotomy and in cases of local inflammation a curious sort of cupping is practised this operation is performed by making incisions in the part and applying it to a bullock's horn with a small hole in the end the operator then takes a piece of bees wax in his mouth and putting his lips to the hole extracts the air from the horn and by a dexterous use of his tongue stops up the hole with the wax this method is found to answer the purpose and in general produces a plentiful discharge when a person of consequence dies the relations and neighbors meet together and manifest their sorrow by loud and dismal howlings a bullock or goat is killed for such persons as come to assist at the funeral which generally takes place in the evening of the same day on which the party died the negroes have no appropriate burial places and frequently dig the grave in the floor of the deceased hut or in the shade of a favorite tree the body is dressed in white cotton and wrapped up in a mat it is carried to the grave in the dusk of the evening by the relations if the grave is without the walls of the town a number of prickly bushes are laid upon it to prevent the wolves from digging up the body but i never observed that any stone was placed over the grave as a monument or memorial of their music and dances some account as incidentally being given in different parts of my journal on the first of these heads i have now to add a list of their musical instruments the principal of which are the kunting a sort of guitar with three strings the koro a large harp with eighteen strings the simpling a small harp with seven strings the balafu an instrument composed of twenty pieces of hard wood of different lengths with the shells of gourds hung underneath to increase the sound the tang tang a drum open at the lower end and lastly the tab ala a large drum commonly used to spread an alarm through the country besides these they make use of small flutes bow-strings elephants teeth and bells and at all their dances and concerts clapping of hands appears to constitute a necessary part of the chorus with the love of music is naturally connected a taste for poetry and fortunately for the poets of africa they are in a great measure exempted from that neglect and indigence which in most polished countries commonly attend the vulgarities of the muses they consist of two classes the most numerous are the singing men called jili k mentioned in a former part of my narrative one or more of these may be found in every town they sing extempore songs in honor of their chief men or any other persons who are willing to give solid pudding for empty praise but a nobler part of their office is to recite the historical events of their country hence in war they accompany the soldiers to the field in order by reciting the great actions of their ancestors to awaken them in a spirit of glorious emulation the other class are devotees of the mohammedan faith 
who travel about the country singing devout hymns and performing religious ceremonies to conciliate the favor of the almighty either in averting calamity or ensuring success to any enterprise both descriptions of these interrent bards are much employed and respected by the people and very liberal contributions are made for them the usual diet of the negroes is somewhat different in different districts in general the people of free condition breakfast about daybreak upon gruel made of meal and water with a little of the fruit of the tamarind to give it an acid taste about two o'clock in the afternoon a sort of hasty pudding with a little shea butter is the common meal but the supper constitutes the principal repast and is seldom ready before midnight this consists almost universally of couscous with a small portion of animal food or shea butter mixed with it it in eating the kaffirs as well as mohammedans use the right hand only the beverages of the pagan negroes are beer and mead of each of which they frequently drink to excess the mohammedan convert drinks nothing but water the natives of all descriptions take snuff and smoke tobacco their pipes are made of wood with an earthen bowl of curious workmanship but in the interior countries the greatest of all luxuries is salt it would appear strange to a european to see a child suck a piece of rock salt as if it were sugar this however i have frequently seen although in the inland parts the poor class of inhabitants are so very rarely indulged with this precious article that to say a man ate salt with his victuals is the same as saying he is a very rich man i have myself suffered great inconvenience from the scarcity of this article the long use of vegetable food creates so painful a longing for salt that no words can sufficiently describe it the negroes in general and the mandingos in particular are considered by the whites on the coast as an indolent and inactive people i think without reason the nature of the climate is indeed unfavorable to great exertion but surely a people cannot justly be denominated habitually indolent who wants are supplied not by the spontaneous productions of nature but by their own exertions few people work harder when occasion requires than the mandingos but not having many opportunities of turning to advantage the superfluous produce of their labor they are content with cultivating as much ground only as is necessary for their own support the labors of the field give them pretty full employment during the rains and in the dry season the people who live in the vicinity of large rivers employ themselves in fishing the fish are taken in wicker baskets or with small cotton nets and are preserved by being first dried in the sun and afterwards rubbed with shea butter to prevent them from contracting fresh moisture others of the natives employ themselves in hunting their weapons are bows and arrows but the arrows in common used are not poisoned footnote poison arrows are used chiefly in war the poison which is said to be very deadly is prepared from a shrub called kunu a species of echtes which is very common in the woods the leaves of this shrub when boiled with a small quantity of water yield a thick black juice in which the negroes dip a cotton thread this thread they fasten round the iron of the arrow in such a manner that it is almost impossible to extract the arrow when it has sunk beyond the barbs without leaving the iron point and the poison thread in the wound End of footnote. 
they are very dexterous marksmen and will hit a lizard on a tree or any other small object at an amazing distance they likewise kill guinea fowls partridges and pigeons but never on the wing while the men are occupied in these pursuits the women are very diligent in manufacturing cotton cloth they prepare the cotton for spinning by laying it in small quantities at a time upon a smooth stone or piece of wood and rolling the seeds out with a thick iron spindle and they spin it with the distaff the thread is not fine but well twisted and makes a very durable cloth a woman with common diligence will spin from six to nine garments of this cloth in one year which according to its fineness will sell for a mincali and a half or two mincalis each footnote a mincali is a quantity of gold nearly equal in value to ten shillings sterling End footnote the weaving is performed by the men the loom is made exactly upon the same principle as that of europe but so small and narrow that the web is seldom more than four inches broad the shuttle is of the common construction but as the thread is coarse the chamber is somewhat larger than the european the women dye this cloth of a rich and lasting blue color by the following simple process the leaves of the indigo when fresh gathered are pounded in a wooden mortar and mixed in a large earthen jar with a strong lay of wood ashes chamber lay is sometimes added the cloth is steeped in this mixture and allowed to remain until it has acquired the proper shade in carta and ludamar where the indigo is not plentiful they collect the leaves and dry them in the sun and when they wish to use them they reduce a sufficient quantity to powder and mix it with the lay as before mentioned either way the color is very beautiful with the fine purple gloss and equal in my opinion to the best indian or european blue this cloth is cut into various pieces and sewed into garments with needles of the natives own making as the arts of weaving dyeing sewing etc may be may easily be acquired those who exercise them are not considered in africa as following any particular profession for almost every slave can weave and every boy can sew the only artists who are distinctly acknowledged as such by the negroes and who value themselves on exercising appropriate and particular trades are the manufacturers of leather and of iron the first of these are called karakankia or as the word is sometimes pronounced gangay they are to be found in almost every town and they frequently travel through the country in the exercise of their calling they tan and dress leather with very great expedition by steeping the hide first in a mixture of wood ashes and water until it parts with the hair and afterwards by using the pounded leaves of a tree called goo as an astringent they are at great pains to render the hide as soft and pliant as possible by rubbing it frequently between their hands and beating it upon a stone the hides of bullocks are converted chiefly into sandals and therefore require less care in dressing than the skins of sheep and goats which are used for covering quivers and saffies and in making sheaves for swords and knives belts pockets and a variety of ornaments these skins commonly are dyed of a red or yellow color the red by means of millet stalks reduced to powder and the yellow by the root of a plant by the name of which i have forgotten the manufacturers in iron are not so numerous as the karen kias but they appear to have studied their business with equal diligence 
the negroes on the coast being cheaply supplied with iron from the european traders never attempt the manufacturing of this article themselves but in the inland parts the natives smelt this useful metal in such quantities not only to supply themselves from it with all necessary weapons and instruments but even to make it an article of commerce with some of the neighboring states during my stay at camilla there was a smelting furnace at a short distance from the hut where i lodged and the owner and his workmen made no secret about the manner of conducting the operation and readily allowed me to examine the furnace and assist them in breaking the ironstone the furnace was a circular tower of clay about ten feet high and three feet in diameter surrounded in two places with weaths to prevent the clay from cracking and falling to pieces by the violence of the heat round the lower part on a level with the ground but not so low as the bottom of the furnace which was somewhat concave were made seven openings into each one of which were placed three tubes of clay and the openings again plastered up in such a manner that no air could enter the furnace but through the tubes by the opening and shutting of which they regulated the fire these tubes were formed by plastering a mixture of clay and grass round a smooth roller of wood which as soon as the clay began to harden was withdrawn and the tube left to dry in the sun the iron stone which i saw was very heavy of a dull red color with grayish specks it was broken into pieces about the size of a hen's egg a bundle of dry wood was first put into the furnace and covered with a considerable quantity of charcoal which was brought ready burnt from the woods over this was laid a stratum of ironstone and then another of charcoal and so on until the furnace was quite full the fire was applied through one of the tubes and blown for some time with bellows made of goat skins the operation went on very slowly at first and it was some hours before the flame appeared above the furnace but after this it burnt with great violence all the first night and the people who attended put in at times more charcoal on the day following the fire was not so fierce and on the second night some of the tubes were withdrawn and the air allowed to have freer access to the furnace but the heat was still very great and a bluish flame rose some feet above the top of the furnace on the third day from the commencement of the operation all the tubes were taken out the ends of many of them being vitrified with the heat but the metal was not removed until some days afterwards when the whole was perfectly cool part of the furnace was then taken down and the iron appeared in the form of a large irregular mass with pieces of charcoal adhering to it it was sonorous and when any portion was broken off the fracture exhibited a granulated appearance like broken steel the owner informed me that many parts of this cake were useless but still there was good iron enough to repay him for his trouble this iron or rather steel is formed into various instruments by being repeatedly heated in a forge the heat of which is urged by a pair of double bellows of a very simple construction being made of two goat skins the tubes from which unite before they enter the forge and supply a constant and very regular blast the hammer forceps and anvil are all very simple and the workmanship particularly in the formation of knives and spears is not destitute of merit the iron indeed is hard and brittle and requires much labor before it can be made to answer the purpose such is the chief information i obtain concerning the present state of arts and manufactures 
in these regions of africa which i explored in my journey i might add though it is scarce worthy observation that in bambara and carta the natives make very beautiful baskets hats and other articles both for use and ornament from rushes which they stain of different colours and they contrive also to cover their calabashes with interwoven cane dyed in the same manner end of volume two chapter twenty one volume two chapter twenty two of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this librivox recording is in the public domain war and slavery a state of subordination and certain inequalities of rank and condition are inevitable in every stage of civil society but when the subordination is carried to so great a length that the persons and services of one part of the community are entirely at the disposal of another part it may then be denominated a state of slavery and in this condition of life a great body of the negro inhabitants of africa have continued from the most early period of their history with this aggravation that their children are born to no other inheritance the slaves in africa i suppose are nearly in the proportion of three to one to the freemen they claim no reward for their services except food and clothing and are treated with kindness or severity according to the good or bad disposition of their masters custom however has established certain rules with regard to the treatment of slaves which is thought dishonorable to violate thus the domestic slaves or such as are born in a man's own house are treated with more lenity than those which are purchased with money the authority of the master over the domestic slave as i have elsewhere observed extends only to a reasonable correction for the master cannot sell his domestic without having first brought him to a public trial before the chief men of the place but these restrictions on the power of the master extend not to the care of prisoners taken in war nor to that of slaves purchased with money all these unfortunate beings are considered as strangers and foreigners who have no right to the protection of the law and may be treated with severity or sold to a stranger according to the pleasure of their owners there are indeed regular markets where slaves of this description are bought and sold and the value of a slave in the eye of an african purchaser increases in proportion to his distance from his native kingdom for when slaves are only a few days journey from the place of their nativity they frequently effect their escape but when one or more kingdoms intervene escape being more difficult they are more readily reconciled to their situation on this account the unhappy slave is frequently transferred from one dealer to another until he has lost all hopes of returning to his native kingdom the slaves which are purchased by the europeans on the coast are chiefly of this description a few of them are collected in the petty wars hereafter to be described which take place near the coast but by far the greater number are brought down in large caravans from the inland countries of which many are unknown even by name to the europeans the slaves which are thus brought from the interior may be divided into two distinct classes first such as were slaves from their birth having been born of enslaved mothers secondly such as were born free but who afterwards by whatever means became slaves those of the first description are by far the most numerous for prisoners taken in war 
at least such as are taken in open and declared war when one kingdom avows hostilities against another are generally of this description the comparatively small proportion of free people to the enslaved throughout africa has already been noticed and it must be observed that men of free condition have many advantages over the slaves even in war time they are in general better armed and well mounted and can either fight or escape with some hopes of success but the slaves who have only their spears and bows and of whom greater numbers are loaded with baggage become easy prey thus when mansong king of bambara made war upon carta as i have related in a former chapter he took in one day nine hundred prisoners of which number not more than seventy were freemen this account i received from damon juma who had thirty slaves at kemu all of whom were made prisoners by masong again when a freeman is taken prisoner his friends will sometimes ransom him by giving two slaves in exchange but when a slave is taken he has no hopes of such redemption to these disadvantages it is to be added that the slatees who purchase slaves in the interior countries and carry them down to the coast for sale constantly prefer such as having been in that condition of life from their infancy well knowing that these have been accustomed to hunger and fatigue and are better able to sustain the hardships of a long and painful journey than freemen and on their reaching the coast if no opportunity offers of selling them to advantage they can easily be made to maintain themselves by their labor neither are they so apt to attempt making their escape as those who have once tasted the blessings of freedom slaves of the second description generally become such by one or other of the following causes one captivity two famine three insolvency four crimes a freeman may by the established customs of africa become a slave by being taken in war war is of all others the most productive source and was probably the origin of slavery for when one nation had taken from another a greater number of captives than could be exchanged on equal terms it is natural to suppose that the conquerors finding it inconvenient to maintain their prisoners would compel them to labor at first perhaps only for their own support but afterwards to support their masters be this as it may it is a known fact that prisoners of war in africa are the slaves of their conquerors and when the weak or unsuccessful warriors begs for mercy beneath the uplifted spear of his opponent he gives up at the same time his claim to liberty and purchases his life at the expense of his freedom in a country divided into a thousand petty states most independent and jealous of each other where every freeman is accustomed to arms and fond of military achievements where the youth who has practised the bow and spear from his infancy longs for nothing so much as an opportunity to display his valour it is natural to imagine that wars frequently originate from very frivolous provocation when one nation is more powerful than another pretext is seldom wanting for commencing hostilities thus the war between kaja and kasson was occasioned by the detention of a fugitive slave that between bambara and carta by the loss of a few cattle other cases of the same nature perpetually occur in which the folly or mad ambition of their princes and the zeal of their religious enthusiasts 
give full employment to the scythe of desolation the wars of africa are of two kinds which are distinguished by different appellations that species which bears the greatest resemblance to our european contests is denominated kelly a word signifying to call out because such wars are openly avowed and previously declared wars of this description in africa commonly terminate however in the course of a single campaign a battle is fought the vanquished seldom think of rallying again the whole inhabitants become panic-struck and the conquerors have only to bind the slaves and carry off their plunder and their victims such of the prisoners as through age or infirmity are unable to endure fatigue or are found unfit for sale are considered as useless and i have no doubt are frequently put to death the same fate commonly awaits a chief or any other person who has taken a very distinguished part in the war and here it may be observed that notwithstanding this exterminating system it is surprising to behold how soon an african town is rebuilt and repeopled the circumstance arises probably from this that their pitched battles are few the weakest know their own situation and seek safety in flight when their country has been desolated and their ruined towns and villages deserted by the enemy such as the inhabitants have escaped the sword and the chain generally return though with cautious steps to the place of their nativity for it seems to be the universal wish of mankind to spend the evening of their days where they pass their infancy the poor negro feels this desire in its full force to him no water is sweet but what is drawn from his own well and no tree has so cool and pleasant a shade as the taba tree footnote this is a large spreading tree a species of steraculia under which the bentang is commonly placed and footnote of his native village when war compels him to abandon the delightful spot in which he first drew his breath and seek for safety in some other kingdom his time is spent in talking about the country of his ancestors and no sooner is peace restored than he turns his back upon the land of strangers rebuilds with haste his fallen walls and exults to see the smoke ascend from his native village the other species of african warfare is distinguished by the appellation of tegria plundering or stealing it arises from a sort of hereditary feud which the inhabitants of one nation or district bear towards the other no immediate cause of hostility is assigned or notice of attack given but the inhabitants of each watch every opportunity to plunder and distress the objects of their animosity by predatory excursions these are very common particularly about the beginning of the dry season when the labor of the harvest is over and provisions are plentiful schemes of vengeance are then meditated the chief man surveys the number and activity of his vassals as they brandish their spears at festivals and elated with their own importance turns his whole thoughts towards revenging some depredation or insult which either he or his ancestors may have received from a neighboring state wars of this description are generally conducted with great secrecy a few resolute individuals headed by some person of enterprise and courage march quietly through the woods surprise in the night some unprotected village and carry off the inhabitants and their effects before their neighbors can come to their assistance one morning during my stay at camilla we were all much alarmed by a party of this kind 
the king of Fuladu's son with five hundred horsemen passed secretly through the woods a little to the southward of Camilla, and on the morning following plundered three towns belonging to Madagai, a powerful chief in Jana Kadu. The success of this expedition encouraged the governor of Bangasi, a town in Fuladu, to make a second inroad upon another part of the same country having assembled about two hundred of his people he passed the river kokoru in the night and carried off a great number of prisoners several of the inhabitants who had escaped these attacks were afterwards seized by the mandingos as they wandered about in the woods or concealed themselves in the glens and strong places of the mountains these plundering excursions always produce speedy retaliation and when large parties cannot be collected for this purpose a few friends will combine together and advance into the enemy's country with a view to plunder or carry off the inhabitants a single individual has been known to take his bow and quiver and proceed in like manner such an attempt is doubtless in him an act of rashness but when it is considered that in one of these predatory wars he has probably been deprived of his child or his nearest relation his situation will rather call for pity than censure the poor sufferer urged on by the feelings of domestic or paternal attachment and the ardour of revenge conceals himself among the bushes until some young or unarmed person passes by he then tiger-like springs upon his prey drags his victim into the thicket and in the night carries him off as a slave when a negro has by means like these once fallen into the hands of his enemies he is either retained as the slave of his conqueror or bartered into a distant kingdom for an african when he has once subdued his enemy will seldom give him an opportunity of lifting up his hand against him at a future period a conqueror commonly disposes of his captives according to the rank which they held in their native kingdom such of the domestic slaves as appear to be of a mild disposition and particularly the young women are retained as his own slaves others that display marks of discontent are disposed of in a distant country and such of the freemen or slaves as have taken an after part in the war are either sold to the slatees or put to death war therefore is certainly the most general and most productive source of slavery and the desolations of war often but not always produce the second cause of slavery famine and in which case a freeman becomes a slave to avoid a greater calamity perhaps by a philosophic and reflecting mind death itself would scarcely be considered as a greater calamity than slavery but the poor negro when fainting with hunger thinks like isu of old behold i am at the point to die and what profit shall this birthright do to me there are many instances of freemen voluntarily surrendering up their liberty to save their lives during a great scarcity which lasted for three years in the countries of gambia great numbers of people became slaves in this manner dr laidley assured me that at that time many freemen came and begged with great earnestness to be put upon his slave chain to save them from perishing of hunger large families are often exposed to absolute want and as the parents have almost unlimited authority over their children it frequently happens in all parts of africa that some of the latter are sold to purchase provisions for the rest of the family when i was at jara 
Damon Juma pointed out to me three young slaves whom he had purchased in this manner. I have already related another instance which I saw at Wanda, and I was informed that in Fuladu at that time it was a very common practice. The third cause of slavery is insolvency. Of all the offenses, if insolvency may be so called, to which the laws of Africa have affixed the punishment of slavery, this is the most common. A negro trader commonly contracts debts on some mercantile speculation, either from his neighbors to purchase such articles as will sell to advantage in a distant market, or from the European traders on the coast, payment to be made in a given time. In both cases the situation of the adventurer is exactly the same. If he succeeds, he may secure an independency. If he is unsuccessful, his person and services are at the disposal of another. For in Africa, not only the effects of the insolvent, but even the insolvent himself, is sold to satisfy the lawful demands of his creditors. Footnote. When a negro takes up goods on credit from any of the Europeans on the coast and does not make payment at the time appointed, the European is authorized by the laws of the country to seize upon the debtor himself, if he can find him, or, if he cannot be found, on any person of his family, or, in the last resort, on any native of the same kingdom. The person thus seized on is detained, while his friends are sent in quest of the debtor. When he is found, a meeting is called of the chief people of the place, and the debtor is compelled to ransom his friend by fulfilling his engagements. If he is unable to do this, his person is immediately secured and sent down to the coast, and the other released. If the debtor cannot be found, the person seized on is obliged to pay double the amount of the debt, or is himself sold into slavery. I was given to understand, however, that this part of the law is seldom enforced. End footnote. A fourth cause above enumerated is the commission of crimes on which the laws of the country affix slavery as a punishment. In Africa, the only offenses of this class are murder, adultery, and witchcraft, and I am happy to say that they did not appear to me to be common. In cases of murder, I was informed that the nearest relation of the deceased had it in his power, after conviction, either to kill the offender with his own hand or sell him into slavery. When adultery occurs, it is generally left to the option of the person injured either to sell the culprit or accept such a ransom for him as he may think equivalent to the injury he has sustained. By witchcraft is meant pretended magic, by which the lives or howls of persons are affected. In other words, it is the administering of poison. No trial for this offence, however, came under my observation while I was in Africa, and I therefore suppose that the crime and its punishment occur, but very seldom. When a freeman has become a slave by any one of the causes before mentioned, he generally continues so for his life, and his children, if they are born of an enslaved mother, are brought up in the same state of servitude. There are, however, a few instances of slaves obtaining their freedom, and sometimes even with the consent of their masters, as by performing some singular piece of service, or by going to battle and bringing home two slaves as a ransom. But the common way of regaining freedom is by escape, and when slaves have once set their minds on running away, they often succeed. Some of them will wait for years before an opportunity presents itself, 
and during that period show no signs of discontent in general it may be remarked that slaves who come from a hilly country and have been much accustomed to hunting and travel are more apt to attempt to make their escape than such as are born in a flat country and have been employed in cultivating the land such are the general outlines of that system of slavery which prevails in africa and it is evident from its nature and extent that it is a system of no modern date it probably has its origin in the remote ages of antiquity before the mohammedans explored a path across the desert how far it is maintained and supported by the slave traffic which for two hundred years the nations of europe have carried on with the natives of the coast it is neither within my providence nor in my power to explain if my sentiments should be required concerning the effect which a discontinuance of that commerce would produce on the manners of the natives i should have no hesitation in observing that in the present unenlightened state of their minds my opinion is the effect would neither be so extensive nor beneficial as many wise and worthy persons fondly expect end of volume two chapter twenty two volume two chapter twenty three of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this librivox recording is in the public domain gold and ivory those valuable commodities gold and ivory the next objects of our inquiry have probably been found in africa from the first ages of the world they are reckoned among its most important productions in the earliest records of its history it has been observed that gold is seldom or never discovered except in mountainous and barren countries nature it is said thus making amends in one way for her penuriousness in the other this however is not wholly true gold is found in considerable quantities throughout every part of manding a country which is indeed hilly but cannot properly be called mountainous much less barren it is also found in great plenty in jalon kadu particularly about buri another hilly but by no means an unfertile country it is remarkable that in the place last mentioned bori which is situated about four days journey to the southwest of camilla the salt market is often supplied at the same time with rock salt from the great desert and sea salt from the rio grande the price of each at the this distance from its source being nearly the same and the dealers in each whether moors from the north or negroes from the west are invited thither by the same motives that are bartering their salt for gold the gold of manding so far as i could learn is never found in any matrix or vein but always in small grains nearly in a pure state from the size of a pin's head to that of a pea scattered through a large body of sand or clay and in this state it is called by the mandingos sano munko gold powder it is however extremely probable by what i could learn of the situation of the ground that most of it has originally been washed down by repeated torrents from the neighboring hills this manner in which it is collected is nearly as follows about the beginning of december when the harvest is over and the streams and torrents have greatly subsided the mansa or chief of the town appoints a day to begin sanu ku gold washing and the women are sure to have themselves in readiness by the time appointed a hoe or spade for digging up the sand 
two or three calabashes for washing in it and a few quills for containing the gold dust are all the implements necessary for the purpose on the morning of their departure a bullock is killed for the first day's entertainment and a number of prayers and charms are used to ensure success for a failure on that day is thought a bad omen the mansa of camilla with fourteen of his people were i remember so much disappointed in their first day's washing that very few of them had resolution to persevere and the few that did had but very indifferent success which indeed is not much to be wondered at for instead of opening some untried place they continued to dig and wash in the same spot where they had dug and washed for years and where of course but very few large grains could be left the washing of the sands of the streams is by far the easiest way of obtaining the gold dust but in most places the sands have been so narrowly searched before that unless the stream takes some new course the gold is found but in small quantities while some of the party are busied in washing the sands others employ themselves farther up the torrent where the rapidity of the stream has carried away all the clay sand etc and left nothing but small pebbles the search among these is a very troublesome task i have seen women who have had the skin worn off the tops of their fingers in this employment sometimes however they are rewarded by finding pieces of gold which they call senu biro gold stones that amply repay them for their trouble a woman and her daughter inhabitants of camilla found in one day two pieces of this kind one of five drachms and the other of three drachms weight but the most certain and profitable mode of washing is practiced in the height of the dry season by digging a deep pit like a draw well near some hill which has previously been discovered to contain gold the pit is dug with small spades or corn hoes and the earth is drawn up in large calabashes as the negroes dig through the different strata of clay or sand a calabash or two of each is washed by way of experiment and in this manner the laborers proceed until they come to a stratum containing gold or until they are obstructed by rocks or inundated by water in general when they come to a stratum of fine reddish sand with small black specks therein they find gold in some proportion or another and send up large calabashes full of the sand for the women to wash for though the pit is dug by the men the gold is always washed by the women who are accustomed from their infancy to a similar operation in separating the husks of corn from the meal as i never descended into one of these pits i cannot say in what manner they are worked underground indeed the situation in which i was placed made it necessary for me to be cautious not to incur the suspicion of the natives by examining too far into the riches of their country but the manner of separating the gold from the sand is very simple and is frequently performed by the women in the middle of the town for when the searchers return from the valleys in the evening they commonly bring with them each a calabash or two of sand to be washed by such of the females as remain at home the operation is simply as follows a portion of sand or clay for the gold is sometimes found in a brown colored clay is put into a large calabash and mixed with a sufficient quantity of water the women whose office it is then shakes the calabash in such a manner as to mix the sand and water together and give the whole a rotatory motion 
at first gently but afterwards more quickly until a small portion of sand and water at every revolution flies over the brim of the calabash the sand thus separated is only the coarsest particles mixed with a little muddy water after the operation has been continued for some time the sand is allowed to subside and the water poured off a portion of coarse sand which is now uppermost in the calabash is removed by the hand and fresh water being added the operation is repeated until the water comes off almost pure the women now take a second calabash and shakes the sand and water gently from the one to the other reserving that portion of sand which is next the bottom of the calabash and which is most likely to contain the gold this small quantity is mixed with some pure water and being moved about in the calabash is carefully examined if a few particles of gold are picked out the contents of the other calabash are examined in the same manner but in general the party is well contented if she can obtain three or four grains from the contents of both calabashes some women however by long practice become so well acquainted with the nature of the sand and the mode of washing it that they will collect gold where others cannot find a single particle the gold dust is kept in quills stopped up with cotton and the washers are fond of displaying a number of these quills in their hair generally speaking if a person uses common diligence in a proper soil it is supposed that as much gold may be collected by him in the course of the dry season as is equal to the value of two slaves thus simple is the process by which the negroes obtain gold in manding and it is evident from this account that the country contains a considerable portion of this precious metal for many of the smaller particles must necessarily escape the observation of the naked eye and as the natives generally search the sands of streams at a considerable distance from the hills and consequently far removed from the mines where the gold was originally produced the laborers are sometimes but ill paid for their trouble minute particles only of this heavy metal can be carried by the current to any considerable distance the larger must remain deposited near the original source from whence they came were the gold-bearing streams to be traced to their fountains and the hills from whence they spring properly examined the sand in which the gold is there deposited would no doubt be found to contain particles of a much larger size and even the small grains might be collected to considerable advantage by the use of quicksilver and other improvements with which the natives are at present unacquainted part of this gold is converted into ornaments for the women but in general these ornaments are more to be admired for their weight than their workmanship they are massy and inconvenient particularly the earrings which are commonly so heavy as to pull down and lacerate the lobe of the ear to avoid which they are supported by a thong of red leather which passes over the crown of the head from one ear to the other the necklace displays greater fancy and the proper arrangement of the different beads and plates of gold is the great criterion of taste and elegance when a lady of consequence is in full dress her gold ornaments may be worth altogether from fifty to eighty pounds sterling a small quantity of gold is likewise employed by the slatties in defraying the expenses of their journeys to and from the coast but by far the greater proportion is annually carried away by the moors in exchange for salt and other merchandise during my stay at camilla the gold collected by the different traders 
at that place for salt alone was nearly equal to one hundred and ninety-eight pounds sterling and as camilla is but a small town and not much resorted to by the trading moors this quantity must have borne a very small proportion to the gold collected at kanakaba kankari and some other large towns the value of salt in this part of africa is very great one slab about two feet and a half in length fourteen inches in breadth and two inches in thickness will sometimes sell for about two pounds ten shillings sterling and from one pound fifteen shillings to two pounds may be considered as the common price four of these slabs are considered as a load for an ass and six for a bullock the value of european merchandise in manding varies very much according to the supply from the coast or the dread of war in the country but the return for such articles is commonly made in slaves the price of a prime slave when i was at camilla was from twelve to nine miniales and european commodities had then nearly the following value eighteen gun flints one minicali forty-eight leaves of tobacco one minicali twenty charges of gunpowder one minicali a cutlass one minicali a musket from three to four minicalis the produce of the country and the different necessaries of life when exchanged for gold sold as follows common provisions for one day the weight of one tea kissy a black bean six of which make the weight of one minicali a chicken one tea kissy a sheep three tea kissy a bullock one millicali a horse from ten to seventeen millicalis the negroes weigh the gold in small balances which they always carry about them they make no difference in point of value between gold dust and wrought gold in bartering one article for another the person who receives the gold always weighs it with his own tea kissy these beans are sometimes fraudulently soaked in shea butter to make them heavy and i once saw a pebble ground exactly in the form of one of them but such practices are not very common having now related the substance of what occurs to my recollection concerning the african mode of obtaining gold from the earth and its value in barter i proceed to the next article of which i propose to treat namely ivory nothing creates a greater surprise among the negroes on the sea coast than the eagerness displayed by the european traders to procure elephants teeth it being exceedingly difficult to make them comprehend to what use it is applied although they are shown knives with ivory handles combs and toys of the same material and are convinced that the ivory thus manufactured was originally parts of a tooth they are not satisfied they suspect that this commodity is more frequently converted in europe to purposes of far greater importance the true nature of which is studiously concealed from them lest the price of ivory should be enhanced they cannot they say easily persuade themselves that ships would be built and voyages undertaken to procure an article which had no other value than that of furnishing handles to knives etc when pieces of wood would answer that purpose equally well elephants are very numerous in the interior of africa but they appear to be distinct species from those found in asia blumenbach in his figures of objects of natural history has given good drawings of a grinder of each 
and the variation is evident m cuvier also has given in the Mag magazine encyclopedique a clear account of the difference between them as i never examined the asiatic elephant i have chosen rather to refer to those writers than advance this as an opinion of my own it has been said that the african elephant is of less docile nature than the asiatic and incapable of being tamed the negroes certainly do not at present tame them but when we consider that the carnathians had always tamed elephants in their armies and actually transported some of them to italy in the course of the punic wars it seems more likely that they should have possessed the art of taming their own elephants than have submitted to the expense of bringing such vast animals from asia perhaps the barbarous practice of hunting the african elephants for the sake of their teeth has rendered them more untractable and savage than they were found to be in former times the great part of the ivory which is sold on the gambia and senegal rivers is brought from the interior country the lands towards the coast are too swampy and too much intersected with creeks and rivers for so bulky an animal as the elephant to travel through without being discovered and when once the natives discern the marks of his feet in the earth the whole village is up in arms the thoughts of feasting on his flesh making sandals of his hide and selling the teeth to the europeans inspire every one with courage and the animal seldom escapes from his pursuers but in the plains of bombara and carta and the extensive wilds of jalon kadu the elephants are very numerous and from the great scarcity of gunpowder in those districts they are less annoyed by the natives scattered teeth are frequently picked up in the woods and travelers are very diligent in looking for them it is a common practice with the elephant to thrust his teeth under the roots of such shrubs and bushes as grow in the more dry and elevated parts of the country where the soil is shallow these bushes he easily overturns and feeds on the roots which are in general more tender and juicy than the hard woody branches or the foliage but when the teeth are partly decayed by age and the roots more firmly fixed the great exertions of the animal in this practice frequently cause them to break short at camilla i saw two teeth one a very large one which were found in the woods and which were evidently broken off in this manner indeed it is difficult otherwise to account for such a large proportion of broken ivory as is daily offered for sale at the different factories for when the elephant is killed in hunting unless he dashes himself over a precipice the teeth are always extracted entire there are certain seasons of the year when the elephants collect into large herds and traverse the country in quest of food or water and as all that part of the country to the north of the niger is destitute of rivers whenever the pools in the woods are dried up the elephants approach towards the banks of that river here they continue until the commencement of the rainy season in the months of june or july and during this time they are much hunted by such of the barbarians as have gunpowder to spare the elephant hunters seldom go out singly a party of four or five join together and having each furnished himself with powder and ball and a quantity of corn meal in a leather bag sufficient for five or six days provision they enter the most unfrequented parts of the wood and examine with great care everything that can lead to the discovery of the elephants 
in this pursuit notwithstanding the bulk of the animal great nicety of observation is required the broken branches the scattered dung of the animal and the marks of his feet are carefully inspected and many of the hunters have by long experience and attentive observation become so expert in their search that as soon as they observe the foot marks of an elephant they will tell almost to a certainty at what time it passed and what distance it will be found when they discover a herd of elephants they follow them at a distance until they perceive some one stray from the rest and come into such a situation as to be fired at with advantage the hunters then approach with great caution creeping amongst the long grass until they have got near enough to be sure of their aim they then discharge all their pieces at once and throw themselves on their faces among the grass the wounded elephant immediately applies his trunk to the different wounds but being unable to extract the balls and seeing nobody near him he becomes quite furious and runs about amongst the bushes until by fatigue and loss of blood he has exhausted himself and affords the hunters an opportunity of firing a second time at him by which he is generally brought to the ground the skin is now taken off and extended on the ground with pegs to dry and such parts of the flesh as are most esteemed are cut up into thin slices and dried in the sun to serve for provisions on some future occasion the teeth are struck out with a light hatchet which the hunters always carry along with them not only for that purpose but also to enable them to cut down such trees as contain honey for though they carry with them only five or six days provisions they will remain in the woods for months if they are successful and support themselves upon the flesh of such elephants as they kill and wild honey the ivory thus collected is seldom brought down to the coast by the hunters themselves they dispose of it to the itinerant merchants who come annually from the coast with arms and ammunition to purchase this valuable commodity some of these merchants will collect ivory in the course of one season sufficient to load four or five asses a great quantity of ivory is likewise brought from the interior by the slave coffles there are however some slatees of the mohammedan persuasion who from motives of religion will not deal in ivory nor eat of the flesh of the elephant unless it has been killed with a spear the quantity of ivory collected in this part of africa is not so great nor are the teeth in general so large as in the countries nearer the line few of them weigh more than eighty or one hundred pounds and upon an average bar of european merchandise may be reckoned as the price of a pound of ivory i have now i trust in this and the preceding chapters explained with sufficient minuteness the nature and extent of the commercial connection which at present prevails and has long subsisted between the negro natives of those parts of africa which i visited and the nations of europe and it appears that slaves gold and ivory together with the few articles enumerated in the beginning of my work viz beeswax and honey hides gums and dye woods constitute the whole catalogue of exportable commodities other productions however have been incidentally noticed as the growth of africa such as grain of different kinds tobacco indigo cotton wool and perhaps a few others but of all these which can only be obtained by cultivation and labor the natives raise sufficient only for their own immediate expenditure 
nor under the present system of their laws manners trade and government can anything further be expected from them it cannot however admit of doubt that all rich and valuable productions both of the east and west indies might easily be naturalized and brought to the utmost perfection in the tropical parts of this immense continent nothing is wanting to this end but example to enlighten the minds of the natives and instruction to enable them to direct their industry to proper objects it was not possible for me to behold the wonderful fertility of the soil the vast herds of cattle proper both for labor and food and a variety of other circumstances favorable to colonization and agriculture and reflect with all on the means which presented themselves of a vast inland navigation without lamenting that a country so abundantly gifted and favored by nature should remain in its present savage and neglected state much more did i lament that a people of manners and disposition so gentle and benevolent should either be left as they now are immersed in the gross and uncomfortable blindness of pagan superstition or permitted to become converts to a system of bigotry and fanaticism which without enlightening the mind often debases the heart on this subject many observations might be made but the reader will probably think that i have already digressed too largely and i now therefore return to my situation at camilla in a volume two chapter twenty three volume two chapter twenty four of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this lieber fox recording is in the public domain mohammedan customs arrival at kinia taraku the schoolmaster to whose care i was entrusted during the absence of karfa was a man of mild disposition and gentle manners his name was fankuma and although he himself adhered strictly to the religion of mohammed he was by no means intolerant in his principles toward others who differed from him he spent much of his time in reading and teaching appeared to be his pleasure as well as employment his school consisted of seventeen boys most of whom were sons of kaffirs and two girls one of whom was karfa's own daughter the girls received their instruction in the daytime but the boys always had their lessons by the light of a large fire before daybreak and again late in the evening for being considered during their scholarship as the domestic slaves of the master they were employed in planting corn bringing firewood and in other servile offices through the day exclusive of the koran and a book or two of commentaries thereon the schoolmaster possessed a variety of manuscripts which had partly been purchased from the trading moors and partly borrowed from bush reens in the neighbourhood and copied with great care other manuscripts had been produced to me at different places in the course of my journey and on recounting those i had before seen and those which were now shown to me and interrogating the schoolmaster on the subject i discovered that the negroes are in possession among others of an arabic version of the pentateuch of moses which they call tareta la musa this is so highly esteemed that it is often sold for the value of one prime slave 
they have likewise a version of the psalms of david zabora dawaldi and lastly the book of Isaiah, which they call lingili la isa and it is in very high esteem i suspect indeed that in all these copies there are interpolations of some of the particular tenets of mohammed for i could distinguish in many passages the name of the prophet it is possible however that this circumstance might otherwise have been accounted for if my knowledge of the arabic had been more extensive by means of these books many of the converted negroes have acquired an acquaintance with some of the remarkable events recorded in the old testament the account of our first parents the death of abel the deluge the lives of abraham isaac and jacob the story of joseph and his brethren the history of moses david solomon etc all these have been related to me in the mandingo language with tolerable exactness by different people and my surprise was not greater on hearing these accounts from the lips of the negroes than theirs on finding that i was already acquainted with them for although the negroes in general have a very great idea of the wealth and power of the europeans i am afraid that the mohammedan converts among them think but very lightly of our superior attainments in religious knowledge the white traders in the maritime districts take no pains to counteract this unhappy prejudice always performing their own devotions in secret and seldom condescending to converse with the negroes in a friendly and instructive manner to me therefore it was not so much the subject of wonder as matter of regret to observe that while the superstition of mohammed has in this manner scattered a few faint beams of learning among these poor people the precious light of christianity is altogether excluded i could not but lament that although the coast of africa has now been known and frequented by the europeans for more than two hundred years yet the negroes still remain entire strangers to the doctrines of our holy religion we are anxious to draw from obscurity the opinions and records of antiquity the beauties of arabian and asiatic literature etc but while our libraries are thus stored with the learning of various countries we distribute with a parsimonious hand the blessings of religious truth to the benighted nations of the earth the natives of asia derive but little advantage in this respect from a intercourse with us and even the poor africans whom we affect to consider as barbarians look upon us i fear as little better than a race of formidable but ignorant heathens when i produced richardson's arabic grammar to some slatees on the gambia they were astounded to think that any european should understand and write the sacred language of their religion at first they suspected it might have been written by some of the slaves carried from the coast but on a closer examination they were satisfied that no bushreen could write such beautiful arabic and one of them offered to give me an ass and sixteen bars of goods if i would part with the book perhaps a short and easy introduction to christianity such as is found in some of the catechisms for children elegantly printed in arabic and distributed on different parts of the coast 
might have a wonderful effect the expense would be but trifling curiosity would induce many to read it and the evident superiority which it would possess over their present manuscripts both in point of elegance and cheapness might at last obtain it a place among the school books of africa the reflections which i have thus ventured to submit to my readers on this important subject naturally suggested themselves to my mind on perceiving the encouragement which was thus given to learning such as it is in many parts of africa i observed that the pupils at camellia were most of them children of pagans their parents therefore could have had no predilection for the doctrines of mohammed their aim was their children's improvement and if a more enlightened system had presented itself it would probably have been preferred the children too wanted not a spirit of emulation which it is the aim of the tutor to encourage when any one of them has read through the koran and performed a certain number of public prayers a feast is prepared by the schoolmaster and the scholar undergoes an examination or in european terms takes out his degree i attended at three different inaugurations of this sort and heard with pleasure the distinct and intelligent answers which the scholars frequently gave to the bushreens who assembled on those occasions and acted as examiners when the bushreens had satisfied themselves respecting the learning and abilities of the scholar the last page of the koran was put into his hand and he was desired to read it aloud after the boy had finished this lesson he pressed the paper against his forehead and pronounced the word amen upon which all the bushreens rose and shaking him cordially by the hand bestowed upon him the title of bushreen when a scholar has undergone this examination his parents are informed that he has completed his education and that it is incumbent on them to redeem their son by giving to the schoolmaster a slave or the price of a slave in exchange which is always done if the parents can afford to do it if not the boy remains the domestic slave of the schoolmaster until he can by his own industry collect goods sufficient to ransom himself about a week after the departure of Carfa, three moors arrived at camilla with a considerable quantity of salt and other merchandise which they had obtained on credit from a merchant of fezan who had lately arrived at kankaba their engagement was to pay him his price when the goods were sold which they expected would be in the course of a month being rigid bushreens they were accommodated with two of Carfa's huts and sold the goods to a very great advantage on the twenty fourth of january Carfa returned to camellia with a number of people and thirteen prime slaves whom he had purchased he likewise brought with him a young girl whom he had married at kankaba as his fourth wife and had given her parents three prime slaves for her she was kindly received at the door of the balloon by Carfa's other wives who conducted their new acquaintance and co-partner into one of the best huts which they had caused to be swept and whitewashed on purpose to receive her my clothes were by this time become so very ragged that i was almost ashamed to appear out of doors but Carfa, on the day after his arrival 
generously presented me with such a garment and trousers as are commonly worn in the country the slaves which carfa had brought with him were all of them prisoners of war they had been taken by the bambara army in the kingdoms of wasala and karta and carried to sago where some of them had remained three years in irons from sago they were sent in company with a number of other captives up the niger in two large canoes and offered for sale at yamina bamaku and kankaba at which places the greater number of the captives were bartered for gold dust and the remainder sent forward to kankari eleven of them confessed to me that they had been slaves from their infancy but the other two refused to give any account of their former condition they were all very inquisitive but they viewed me at first with looks of horror and repeatedly asked if my countrymen were cannibals they were very desirous to know what became of the slaves after they crossed the salt water i told them that they were employed in cultivation of the land but they would not believe me and one of them putting his hand upon the ground said with great simplicity have you really got such ground as this to set your feet upon a deeply rooted idea that the whites purchase negroes for the purpose of devouring them or of selling them to others that they may be devoured hereafter naturally makes the slaves contemplate a journey towards the coast with great terror insomuch that the slatees are forced to keep them constantly in irons and watch them very closely to prevent their escape they are commonly secured by putting the right leg of one and the left of another into the same pair of fetters by supporting the feathers with a string they can walk though very slowly every four slaves are likewise fastened together by the necks with a strong rope of twisted thongs and in the night an additional pair of fetters is put on their hands and sometimes a light iron chain passed round their necks such of them as evince marks of discontent are secured in a different manner a thick billet of wood is cut about three feet long and a smooth notch being made upon one side of it the ankle of the slave is bolted to the smooth part by means of a strong iron staple one prong of which passes on each side of the ankle all these fetters and bolts are made from native iron in the present case they were put on by the blacksmith as soon as the slaves arrived from kankaba and were not taken off until the morning on which the coffle departed for gambia in other respects the treatment of the slaves during their stay at camilla was far from being harsh or cruel they were led out in their fetters every morning to the shade of the tamarind tree where they were encouraged to play at games of hazard and sing diverting songs to keep up their spirits for though some of them sustained the hardships of their situation with amazing fortitude the greater part were very much dejected and would sit all day in a sort of sullen melancholy with their eyes fixed upon the ground in the evening their irons were guarded during the night by carfa's domestic slaves but notwithstanding all this about a week after their arrival one of the slaves had the address to procure a small knife with which he opened the rings of his fetters cut the rope and made his escape more of them would probably have got off had they assisted each other but the slave no sooner found himself at liberty 
then he refused to stop and assist in breaking the chain which was fastened round the necks of his companions as all the slatties and slaves belonging to the coffle were now assembled either at camilla or at some of the neighboring villages it might have been expected that we should set out immediately for gambia but though the day of our departure was frequently fixed it was always found expedient to change it some of the people had not prepared their dry provisions others had gone to visit their relations or collect some trifling debts and last of all it was necessary to consult whether the day would be a lucky one on account of one of these or other such cases our departure was put off day after day until the month of february was far advanced after which all the slatties agreed to remain in their present quarters until the fast moon was over and here i may remark that loss of time is an object of no great importance in the eyes of a negro if he has anything of consequence to perform it is a matter of indifference to him whether he does it to-day or to-morrow or a month or two hence so long as he can spend the present moment with any degree of comfort he gives himself very little concern about the future the fast of ramadan was observed with great strictness by all the bush queens but instead of compelling me to follow their example as the moors did on a similar occasion Carfa frankly told me that i was at liberty to pursue my own inclination in order however to manifest a respect for their religious opinions i voluntarily fasted three days which was thought sufficient to screen me from the reproachful epithet of kaffir during the fast all the slatties belonging to the coffle assembled every morning in karfa's house where the schoolmaster read to them some religious lessons from a large folio volume the author of which was an arab of the name of shifa in the evening such of the women had had embraced mohammedism assembled and said their prayers publicly at the misura they were all dressed in white and went through the different prostrations prescribed by their religion with becoming solemnity indeed during the whole fast of ramadan the negroes behaved themselves with the greatest meekness and humility forming a striking contrast to the savage intolerance and brutal bigotry which at this period characterize the moors when the fast month was almost at an end the bushreens assembled at the misura to watch for the appearance of the new moon but the evening being rather cloudy they were for some time disappointed and a number of them had gone home with a resolution to fast another day when on a sudden this delightful object showed her sharp horns from behind a cloud and was welcomed with the clapping of hands beating of drums firing of muskets and other marks of rejoicing as this moon is reckoned extremely lucky Carfa gave orders that all the people belonging to the coffle should immediately pack up their dry provisions and hold themselves in readiness and on the sixteenth of april the slatties held a consultation and fixed on the nineteenth of the same month as the day on which the coffle should depart from camilla this resolution freed me from much uneasiness for our departure had already been so long deferred that i was apprehensive it might still be put off 
until the commencement of the rainy season and although carfa behaved towards me with the greatest kindness i found my situation very unpleasant the slatties were unfriendly to me and the trading moors who were at this time at camilla continued to plot mischief against me from the first day of their arrival under these circumstances i reflected that my life in a great measure depended on the good opinion of an individual who was daily hearing malicious stories concerning the europeans and i could hardly expect that he would always judge with impartiality between me and his countrymen time had indeed reconciled me in some degree to their mode of life and a smoky hut or a scanty supper gave me no great uneasiness but i became at last wearied out with a constant state of alarm and anxiety and felt a painful longing for the manifold blessings of civilized society april nineteenth the long wished-for day of our departure was at length arrived and the slatties having taken the irons from their slaves assembled with them at the door of carfa's house where the bundles were all tied up and every one had his load assigned him the coffle on its departure from camilla consisted of twenty-seven slaves for sale the property of carfa and four other slatties but we were afterwards joined by five at marabou and three at bala making in all thirty-five slaves the freemen were fourteen in number but most of them had one or two wives and some domestic slaves and the schoolmaster who was now upon his return for word ado the place of his nativity took with him eight of his scholars so that the number of free people and domestic slaves amounted to thirty-eight and the whole amount of the coffle was seventy-three among the freemen were six jillikias singing men whose musical talents were frequently exerted either to divert our fatigue or obtain us a welcome from strangers when we departed from camilla we were followed for about half a mile by most of the inhabitants of the town some of them crying and others shaking hands with their relations who were now about to leave them and when we had gained a piece of rising ground from which we had a view of camilla all the people belonging to the coffle were ordered to sit down in one place with their faces towards the west and the townspeople were desired to sit down in another place with their faces towards camilla in this situation the schoolmaster with two of the principal slatties having taken their places between the two parties pronounced a long and solemn prayer after which they walked three times round the coffle making an impression in the ground with the ends of their spears and muttering something by the way of charm when this ceremony was ended all the people belonging to the coffle sprang up and without taking a formal farewell of their friends set forwards as many of the slaves had remained for years in irons the sudden exertion of walking quickly with heavy loads upon their heads occasioned spasmodic contractions of their legs and we had not proceeded above a mile before it was found necessary to take two of them from the rope and allow them to walk more slowly until we reached marabou a walled village where some people were waiting to join the coffle here we stopped about two hours to allow the strangers time to pack up 
their provisions and then continued our route to bala which town we reached about four in the afternoon the inhabitants of bala at this season of the year subsist chiefly on fish which they take in great plenty from the streams in the neighborhood we remained here until the afternoon of the next day the twentieth when we proceeded to warumbang the frontier village of manding towards jalon kadu as we proposed shortly to enter the jalonka wilderness the people of this village furnished us with great plenty of provisions and on the morning of the twenty first we entered the woods to the westward of warumbang after having travelled some little way a consultation was held whether we should continue our route through the wilderness or save one day's provisions by going to Kinitakoru, a town in Jalon Kadu. After debating the matter for some time, it was agreed that we should take the road for Kinitakoru, but as that town was a long day's journey distant, it was necessary to take some refreshment. Accordingly, every person opened his provision bag and brought a handful or two of meal to the place where Carfa and the Slatees were sitting. When every one had brought his quota, and the whole was properly arranged in small gourd shells, the schoolmaster offered up a short prayer, the substance of which was that God and the Holy Prophet might preserve us from robbers and all bad people that our provisions might never fail us nor our limbs become fatigued this ceremony being ended every one partook of the meal and drank a little water after which we set forward rather running than walking until we came to the river kokoru a branch of the senegal where we halted about ten minutes the banks of this river are very high, and from the grass and brushwood which had been left by the stream, it was evident that at this place the water had risen more than twenty feet perpendicular during the rainy season. At this time it was only a small stream, such as would turn a mill, swarming with fish and on account of the number of crocodiles and the danger of being carried past the ford by the force of the stream in the rainy season it is called kokoru dangerous from this place we continued to travel with the greatest expedition and in the afternoon crossed two small branches of the kokoru about sunset we came in sight of Kinitakoru, a considerable town, nearly square, situated in the middle of a large and well-cultivated plain. Before we entered the town, we halted until the people who had fallen behind came up. During this day's travel, two slaves, a woman and a girl, belonging to a slatti of Bala, were so much fatigued that they could not keep up with the coffin. They were severely whipped and dragged along until about three o'clock in the afternoon, when they were both afflicted with vomiting, by which it was discovered that they had eaten clay. This practice is by no means uncommon amongst the Negroes, but whether it arises from a vit appetite or from a settled intention to destroy themselves i cannot affirm they were permitted to lie down in the woods and three people remained with them until they had rested themselves but they did not arrive at the town until past midnight and were then so much exhausted that the slatti gave up 
all thoughts of taking them across the woods in their present condition and determined to return with them to bala and wait for another opportunity as this was the first town beyond the limits of manding greater etiquette than usual was observed every person was ordered to keep his proper station and we marched towards the town in a sort of procession nearly as follows in front five or six singing men all of them belonging to the coffle these were followed by the other free people then came the slaves fastened in the usual way by a rope round their necks four of them to a rope and a man with a spear between each four after them came the domestic slaves and in the rear the women of free condition wives of the slatees etc in this manner we proceeded until we came within a hundred yards of the gate when the singing man began a loud song well calculated to flatter the vanity of the inhabitants by extolling their known hospitality to strangers and their particular friendship for the mandingos when we entered the town we proceeded to the bentang where the people gathered round us to hear our dentengi history this was related publicly by two of the singing men they enumerated every little circumstance which happened to the coffle beginning with the events of the present day and relating everything in a backward series until they reached camilla when this history was ended the master of the town gave them a small present and all the people of the coffle both free and enslaved were invited by some person or another and accommodated with lodging and provisions for the night end of volume two chapter twenty four volume two chapter twenty five of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this librivox recording is in the public domain the jalonka wilderness a warlike tale we continued at kini ta koru until noon of the twenty second of april when we removed to a village about seven miles to the westward the inhabitants of which being apprehensive of hostilities from the fulas of fuladu were at this time employed in constructing small temporary huts among the rocks on the side of a high hill close to the village the situation was almost impregnable being everywhere surrounded with high precipices except on the eastern side where the natives had left a pathway sufficient to allow one person at a time to ascend upon the brow of the hill immediately over this path i observed several heaps of large loose stones which the people told me were intended to be thrown down upon the fulas if they should attempt the hill at daybreak on the twenty third we departed from this village and entered the jalonka wilderness we passed in the course of the morning the ruins of two small towns which had lately been burnt by the fulas the fire must have been very intense for i observed that the walls of many of the huts were slightly vitrified and appeared at a distance as if covered with a red varnish about ten o'clock we came to the river wanda which is somewhat larger than the river kokoru but the stream was at this the rather muddy which karfa assured me was occasioned by amazing shoals of fish they were indeed seen in all directions and in such abundance that i fancied the water itself tasted and smelt fishy 
as soon as we had crossed the river karfa gave orders that all the people of the coffle should in future keep close together and travel in their proper station the guides and young men were accordingly placed in the van the women and slaves in the center and the freemen in the rear in this order we traveled with uncommon expedition through a woody but beautiful country interspersed with a pleasing variety of hill and dale and abundant with partridges guinea fowl and deer until sunset when we arrived at a most romantic stream called ko Masang. my arms and neck having been exposed to the sun during the whole day and irritated by the rubbing of my dress in walking were now very much inflamed and covered with blisters and i was happy to embrace the opportunity while the coffle rested on the bank of the river to bathe myself in the stream this practice together with the cool of the evening much diminished the inflammation about three miles to the westward of the Komasang, we halted in a thick wood and kindled our fires for the night we were all by this time very much fatigued having as i judged traveled this day thirty miles but no person was heard to complain whilst supper was preparing karfa made one of the slaves break some branches from the trees for my bed when we had finished our supper of couscous moistened with some boiling water and put the slaves in irons we all lay down to sleep but we were frequently disturbed in the night by the howling of wild beasts and we found the small brown ants very troublesome april twenty fourth before daybreak the bushreens said their morning prayers and most of the free people drank a little moing a sort of gruel part of which was likewise given to such of the slaves as appeared least able to sustain the fatigues of the day one of karfa's female slaves was very sulky and when some gruel was offered to her she refused to drink it as soon as day dawned we set out and travelled the whole morning over a wild and rocky country by which my feet were much bruised and i was sadly apprehensive that i should not be able to keep up with a coffle during the day but i was in a great measure relieved from this anxiety when i observed that others were more exhausted than myself in particular the woman slave who had refused victuals in the morning began now to lag behind and complained dreadfully of pains in her legs her load was taken from her and given to another slave and she was ordered to keep in the front of the coffle about eleven o'clock as we were resting by a small rivulet some of the people discovered a hive of bees in a hollow tree and they were proceeding to obtain the honey when the largest swarm i have ever beheld flew out and attacking the people of the coffle made us fly in all directions i took the alarm first and i believe was the only person who escaped with impunity when our enemies thought fit to desist from pursuing us and every person was employed in picking out the stings he had received it was discovered that the poor woman above mentioned whose name was neely was not come up and as many of the slaves in their retreat had left their brindles behind them it became necessary for some persons to return and bring them in order to do this with safety fire was set to the grass a considerable way to the eastward of the hive and the wind driving the fire furiously along the party pushed through the smoke and recovered the bundles they likewise brought with them poor neelie whom they found lying by the rivulet 
she was very much exhausted and had crept to the stream in hopes to defend herself from the bees by throwing water over her body but this proved ineffectual for she was stung in the most dreadful manner when the slatties had picked out the stings as far as they could she was washed with water and then rubbed with bruised leaves but the wretched woman obstinately refused to proceed any farther declaring that she would rather die than walk another step as entreaties and threats were used in vain the whip was at length applied and after bearing patiently a few strokes she started up and walked with tolerable exhibition for four or five hours longer when she made an attempt to run away from the coffle but was so very weak that she fell down in the grass though she was unable to rise the whip was a second time applied but without effect upon which Carfa desired two of the slatties to place her upon the ass which carried our dry provisions but she could not sit erect and the ass being very refractory it was found impossible to carry her forward in this manner the slatties however were unwilling to abandon her the day's jury being nearly ended and therefore made a sort of litter of bamboo canes upon which she was placed and tied on it with slips of bark this litter was carried upon the heads of two slaves one walking before the other and they were followed by two others who relieved them occasionally in this manner the woman was carried forward until it was dark when we reached a stream of water at the foot of a high hill called gangkaran kuru and here we stopped for the night and set about preparing our supper as we had only ate one handful of meal since the preceding night and travelled all day in a hot sun many of the slaves who had loads upon their heads were very much fatigued and some of them snapped their fingers which among the negroes is a sure sign of desperation the slatties immediately put them all in irons and such of them had evinced signs of great despondency were kept apart from the rest and had their hands tied in the morning they were found greatly recovered april twenty fifth at daybreak poor neelie was awakened but her limbs were now become so stiff and painful that she could neither walk nor stand she was therefore lifted like a corpse upon the back of an ass and the slatties endeavoured to secure her in that situation by fastening her hands together under the ass's neck and her feet under the belly with long slips of bark but the ass was so very unruly that no sort of treatment could induce him to proceed with his load and as neelie made no exertion to prevent herself from falling she was quickly thrown off and had one of her legs much bruised every attempt to carry her forward being thus found ineffectual the general cry of the coffle was kang tigri kang tigri cut her throat cut her throat an operation i did not wish to see performed and therefore marched onwards with the foremost of the coffle i had not walked about a mile when one of carfle's domestic slaves came up to me with poor neela's garment upon the end of his bow and exclaimed neely afelita neely is lost i asked him whether the slatties had given him the garment as a reward for cutting her throat he replied that carfa and the schoolmaster would not consent to the measure but had left her on the road where undoubtedly she soon perished and was probably devoured by wild beasts 
the sad fate of this wretched woman notwithstanding the outcry before mentioned made a strong impression on the mind of the whole coffle and the schoolmaster fasted the whole of the ensuing day in a consequence of it we proceeded in deep silence and soon afterwards crossed the river fukoma which was about as large as the river wanda we now travelled with great expedition every one being apprehensive he might otherwise meet with the fate of poor neely it was however with great difficulty that i could keep up although i threw away my spear and everything that could in the la least obstruct me about noon we saw a large herd of elephants but they suffered us to pass unmolested and in the evening we halted near a thicket of bamboo but found no water so that we were forced to proceed four miles farther to a small stream where we stopped for the night we had marched this day as i judged about twenty-six miles april twenty six this morning two of the schoolmaster's pupils complained much of pains in their legs and one of the slaves walked lame the soles of his feet being very much blistered and inflamed we proceeded notwithstanding and about eleven o'clock began to ascend a rocky hill called boki koru and it was past two in the afternoon before we reached the level ground on the other side this was the most rocky road we had yet encountered and it hurt our feet much in a short time we arrived at a pretty large river called boki which we forded it ran smooth and clear over a bed of windstone about a mile to the westward of the river we came to a road which leads to the northeast towards gadu and seeing the marks of many horses feet upon the soft sand the slatees conjectured that a party of plunderers had lately rode that way to fall upon some town of gadu and lest they should discover upon their return that we had passed an attempt to pursue us by the marks of our feet the coffle was ordered to disperse and travel in a loose manner through the high grass and bushes a little before it was dark having crossed the ridge of hills to the westward of the river boki we came to a well called kolong ki white sand well and here we rested for the night april twenty seventh we departed from the well early in the morning and walked on with greatest alacrity in hopes of reaching a town before night the road during the forenoon led through extensive thickets of dry bamboos about two o'clock we came to a stream called nankolo where we were each of us regaled with a handful of a meal which according to a superstitious custom was not to be eaten until it was first moistened with water from this stream about four o'clock we reached susita a small jalonka village situated in the district of kulo which comprehends all that tract of country lying along the banks of the black river or main branch of the senegal these were the first human habitations we had seen since we left the village to the westward of kinitakuru having travelled in the course of the last five days upwards of one hundred miles here after a great deal of entreaty we were provided with huts to sleep in but the master of the village plainly told us that he could not give us any provisions as there had lately been a great scarcity in this part of the country he assured us that before they had gathered in their present crops the whole inhabitants of kulo had been for twenty-nine days without tasting corn 
during which time they supported themselves entirely upon the yellow powder which is found in the pods of the nita so called by the natives a species of mimosa and upon the seeds of the bamboo cane which when properly pounded and dressed tastes very much like rice as our dry provisions were not yet exhausted a considerable quantity of couscous was dressed for supper and many of the villagers were invited to take part of the repast but they made a very bad return for this kindness for in the night they seized upon one of the schoolmaster's boys who had fallen asleep under the bentang tree and carried him away the boy fortunately awoke before he was far from the village and setting up a loud scream the man who carried him put his hand upon his mouth and ran with him into the woods but afterwards understanding that he belonged to the schoolmaster whose place of residence is only three days journey distant he thought i suppose that he could not retain him as a slave without the schoolmaster's knowledge and therefore stripped off the boy's clothes and permitted him to return april twenty eighth early in the morning we departed from susita and about ten o'clock came to an unwalled town called mana the inhabitants of which were employed in collecting the fruit of the nita trees which are very numerous in the neighborhood the pods are long and narrow and contain a few black seeds enveloped in the fine mealy powder before mentioned the meal itself is of a bright yellow color resembling the flower of sulphur and has a sweet mucilaginous taste when eaten by itself it is clammy but when mixed with milk or water it constitutes a very pleasant and nourishing article of diet the language of the people of mana is the same that is spoken all over that extensive and hilly country called jal okanda and hilly country called jal on kadu some of the words have great affinity to the mandingo but the natives themselves consider it as a distinct language their numerals are these one kidding two fitting three sarah four nanny five sulo six seni seven sulo ma fitting eight sulo ma sarah nine sula ma nanny ten nuff the jalonkas like the mandingos are governed by a number of petty chiefs who are in a great measure independent of each other they have no common sovereign and the chiefs are seldom upon such terms of friendship as to assist each other even in war time the chief of mana with a number of his people accompanied us to the banks of the baffing or black river a principal branch of the senegal which we crossed upon a bridge of bamboos of a very singular construction the river at this place is smooth and deep and has very little current two tall trees when tied together by the tops are sufficiently long to reach from one side to the other the roots resting upon the rocks and the tops floating in the water when a few trees have been placed in this direction they are covered with dry bamboos so as to form a floating bridge with a sloping gangway at each end where the trees rest upon the rocks this bridge is carried away every year by the swelling of the river in the rainy season and is constantly rebuilt by the inhabitants of mana who on that account expect a small tribute from every passenger in the afternoon we passed several villages at none of which we could procure lodging 
and in the twilight we received information that two hundred jalancas had assembled near a town called milo with a view to plunder the coffle this induced us to alter our course and we travelled with great secrecy until midnight when we approached a town called koba before we entered the town the names of all the people belonging to the coffle were carried over and a freeman and three slaves were found to be missing every person immediately concluded that the slaves had murdered the freemen and made their escape it was therefore agreed that six people should go back as far as the last village and endeavor to find his body or collect some information concerning the slaves in the meantime the cough was ordered to lie concealed in a cotton field near a large nida tree and nobody to speak except in whisper it was towards morning before the six men returned having heard nothing of the man or the slaves as none of us had tasted victuals for the last twenty-four hours it was agreed that we should go into koba and endeavor to procure some provisions we accordingly entered the town before it was quite day and Karfa purchased from the chief man for three strings of beads a considerable quantity of ground nuts which we roasted and ate for breakfast we were afterwards provided with huts and rested here for the day about eleven o'clock to our great joy and surprise the freemen and slaves who had parted from the coffle the preceding night entered the town one of the slaves it seems had hurt his foot and the night being very dark they soon lost sight of the coffle the freeman as soon as he found himself alone with the slaves was aware of his own danger and insisted on putting them in irons the slaves were at first rather unwilling to submit but when he threatened to stab them one by one with his spear they made no farther resistance and he remained with them among the bushes until morning when he let them out of irons and came to town in hopes of hearing which route the coffle had taken the information that we received concerning the jalancas who intended to rob the coffle was this day confirmed and we were forced to remain here until the afternoon of the thirtieth when karfa hired a number of people to protect us and we proceeded to a village called ting king tang departing this village on the day following we crossed a high ridge of mountains to the west of the black river and travelled over a rough stony country until sunset when we arrived at ling ikata a small village in the district of war adu here we shook out the last handful of meal from our dry provision bags this being the second day since we crossed the black river that we had travelled from morning until night without tasting one morsel of food may second we departed from ling ikata but the sleighs being very much fatigued we halted for the night at a village about nine miles to the westward and procured some provisions through the interest of the schoolmaster who now sent forward a messenger to malacotta his native town to inform his friends of his arrival in the country and to desire them to provide the necessary quantity of victuals to entertain the coffle for two or three days may third we set out for malacotta and about noon arrived at a village near a considerable stream of water which flows to the westward here we determined to stop for the return of the messenger who had been sent to malacotta the day before and as the natives assured me there were no crocodiles in the stream i went and bathed myself very few people here can swim 
for they came in numbers to dissuade me from venturing into a pool where they said the water would come over my head about two o'clock the messenger returned from malacotta and the schoolmaster's elder brother being impatient to see him came along with the messenger to meet him at this village the interview between the two brothers who had not seen each other for nine years was very natural and affecting they fell upon each other's neck and it was some time before either of them could speak at length when the schoolmaster had a little recovered himself he took his brother by the hand and turning round this is the man said he pointing to karfa who has been my father in manding i would have pointed him out sooner to you but my heart was too full we reached malacotta in the evening where we all were well received this is an unwalled town the huts for the most part are made of split cane twisted into a sort of wicker walk and plastered over with mud here we remained three days and were each day presented with a bullock from the schoolmaster we were likewise well entertained by the townspeople who appear to be very active and industrious they make very good soap by boiling ground nuts in water and then adding a lay of wood ashes they likewise manufacture excellent iron which they carry to bondu to barter for salt a party of the townspeople had lately returned from a trading expedition of this kind and brought information concerning a war between alamami abdulkadar king of futatora and damel king of the jalofs the events of this war soon became a favorite subject with the singing men and the common topic of conversation in all the kingdoms bordering upon the senegal and gambia and as the account is somewhat singular i shall here abridge it for the reader's information the king of futa tora inflamed with a zeal for propagating his religion has sent an embassy to damo similar to that which he had sent to Kasson, as has been previously related the ambassador on the present occasion was accompanied by two of the principal bushreens who carried each a large knife fixed on the top of a long pole as soon as he had procured admission into the presence of damel and announced the pleasure of his sovereign he ordered the bushreens to present the emblems of his mission the two knives were accordingly laid before damel and the ambassador explained himself as follows with this knife said he abdul kadar will condescend to shave the head of damel if damel will embrace the mohammedan faith and with this other knife abdul kadar will cut the throat of damel if damel refuses to embrace it take your choice damel coolly told the ambassador that he had no choice to make he neither chose to have his head shaved nor his throat cut and with this answer the ambassador was civilly dismissed abdul kadar took his measures accordingly and with a powerful army invaded damel's country the inhabitants of the towns and village filled up their wells destroyed their provisions carried off their effects and abandoned their dwellings as he approached by this means he was led on from place to place until he had advanced three days journey into the country of the jalofs he had indeed met with no opposition but his army had suffered so much from the scarcity of water that several of his men had died by the way this induced him to direct his march towards a watering place in the woods 
where his men having quenched their thirst and being overcome with fatigue lay down carelessly to sleep among the bushes in this situation they were attacked by damel before daybreak and completely routed many of them were trampled to death as they lay asleep by the jaloff horses others were killed in attempting to make their escape and a still greater number were taken prisoners among the latter was abdul kadar himself this ambitious or rather frantic prince who but a month before had sent the threatening message to damel was now himself led into his presence as a miserable captive the behavior of damel on this occasion is never mentioned by the singing men but in terms of the highest approbation and it was indeed so extraordinary in an african prince that the reader may find it difficult to give credit to the recital when his royal prisoner was brought before him in irons and thrown upon the ground the magnanimous damel instead of setting his foot upon his neck and stabbing him with his spear according to custom in such cases addressed him as follows abdul kadar answer me this question if the chance of war had placed me in your situation and you in mine how would you have treated me i would have thrust my spear into your heart returned abdul kadar with great firmness and i know that a similar fate awaits me not so said damel my spear is indeed red with the blood of your subjects killed in battle and i could now give it a deeper stain by dipping it in your own but this would not build up my towns nor bring to life the thousands who fell in the woods i will not therefore kill you in cold blood but i will retain you as my slave until i perceive that your presence in your own kingdom will be no longer dangerous to your neighbors and then i will consider of the proper way of disposing of you abdul kadar was accordingly retained and worked as a slave for three months at the end of which period damel listened to the solicitations of the inhabitants of futa torah and restored to them their king strange as this story may appear i have no doubt of the truth of it it was told me at malacotta by the negroes it was afterwards related to me by the europeans on the gambia by some of the french at goree and confirmed by nine slaves who were taken prisoners along with abdul kadar by the watering place in the woods and carried in the same ship with me to the west indies end of volume two chapter twenty five Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 2, Chapter 26 of The Travels in the Interior of Africa by Mungo Park. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Meeting with Dr. Laidley. Return to the Coast. Voyage to england on the seventh of may we departed from malacotta and having crossed the bali honey river a branch of the senegal we arrived in the evening at a walled town called bintingala where we rested two days from thence in one day more we proceeded to din iku a small town situated at the bottom of a high ridge of hills from which this district is named kon kodu the country of mountains these hills are very productive of gold i was shown a small quantity of this metal which had been lately collected the grains were about the usual size 
but much flatter than those of manding and were found in white quartz which had been broken to pieces by hammers at this town i met with a negro whose hair and skin were of a dull white color he was of that sort which are called in the spanish west indies albinos or white negroes the skin is cadaverous and unsightly and the natives considered this complexion i believe truly as the effect of disease may eleventh at daybreak we departed from din e kuku and after a toilsome day travel arrived in the evening at sata du the capital of a district of the same name this town was formerly of considerable extent but many families had left it in consequence of the predatory incursions of the fulas of fula jala who made it a practice to come secretly through the woods and carry off people from the cornfields and even from the wells near the town in the afternoon of the twelfth we crossed the falami river the same which i had formerly crossed at bondu in my journey eastward this river at the season of the year is easily forded at this place the stream being only about two feet deep the water is very pure and flows rapidly over a bed of sand and gravel we launched for the night at a small village called mendina the sole property of a mandingo merchant who by a long intercourse with europeans has been induced to adopt some of their customs his victuals were served up in pewter dishes and even his houses were built after the fashion of the english houses on the gambia may thirteenth in the morning as we were preparing to depart a coffle of slaves belonging to some sarawoolly traders crossed the river and agreed to proceed with us to bain sur lee the capital of dentilla a very long day's journey from this place we accordingly set out together and travelled with great expedition through the woods until noon when one of the sarawoolly slaves dropped the load from his head for which he was smartly whipped the load was replaced but he had not proceeded above a mile before he let it fall a second time for which he received the same punishment after this he travelled in great pain until about two o'clock when we stopped to breathe a little by a pool of water the day being remarkably hot the poor slave was now so completely exhausted that his master was obliged to release him from the rope for he lay motionless on the ground a sarah woolly therefore undertook to remain with him and endeavour to bring him to the town during the cool of the night in the meanwhile we continued our route and after a very hard stay travel arrived at ban surly late in the evening one of our slatties was a native of this place from which he had been absent three years this man invited me to go with him to his house at the gate of which his friends met him with many expressions of joy shaking hands with him embracing him and singing and dancing before him as soon as he had seated himself upon a mat by the threshold of his door a young woman his intended bride brought a little water in a calabash and kneeling down before him desired him to wash his hands when he had done this the girl with a tear of joy sparkling in her eyes drank the water this being considered as the greatest proof she could possibly give him of her fidelity and attachment about eight o'clock the same evening the sarah woolly who had been left in the woods to take care of the fatigued slave returned and told us that he was dead the general opinion however was that he himself had killed him or left him to perish on the road for the sarah woollies are said to be 
infinitely more cruel in their treatment of slaves than the mandingos we remained at bay two days in order to purchase native iron shea butter and some other articles for sale on the gambia and here the slattee who had invited me to his house and who possessed three slaves part of the coffle had obtained information that the price on the coast was very low determined to separate from us and remain with his slaves where he was until an opportunity should offer of disposing of them to advantage giving us to understand that he should complete his nuptials with the young woman before mentioned in the meantime may sixteenth we departed from basarilli and travelled through the thick woods until noon when we saw at a distance the town of julifunda but did not approach it as we proposed to rest for the night at a large town called kirwani which we reached about four o'clock in the afternoon this town stands in a valley and the country for more than a mile around it is cleared of wood and well cultivated the inhabitants appear to be very active and industrious and seem to have carried the system of agriculture to some degree of perfection for they collect the dung of their cattle into large heaps during the dry season for the purpose of manuring their land with it at the proper time i saw nothing like this in any other part of africa near the town are several smelting furnaces from which the natives obtain very good iron they afterwards hammer the metal into small bars about a foot in length and two inches in breadth one of which bars is sufficient to make two mandingo corn hoes on the morning after our arrival we were visited by a slattee of this place who informed karfa that among some slaves he had lately purchased was a native of futa jala and as that country was no great distance he could not safely employ him in the labors of the field lest he should effect his escape the slattee was therefore desirous of exchanging this slave for one of karfa's and offered some cloth and shea butter to induce karfa to comply with the proposal which was accepted the slattee thereupon sent a boy to order the slave in question to bring him a few ground nuts the poor creature soon afterwards entered the court in which we were sitting having no suspicion of what was negotiating until the master caused the gate to be shut and told him to sit down the slave now saw his danger and perceiving the gate to be shut upon him threw down the nuts and jumped over the fence he was immediately pursued and overtaken by the slattees who brought him back and secured him in irons after which one of karfa's slaves was released and delivered in exchange the unfortunate captive was at first very much dejected but in the course of a few days his melancholy gradually subsided and he became at length as cheerful as any of his companions departing from kirwani on the morning of the twentieth we entered the tenda wilderness of two days journey the woods were very thick and the country shelved towards the southwest about ten o'clock we met a coffle of twenty-six people and seven loaded asses returning from the gambia most of the men were armed with muskets and had broad belts of scarlet cloth over their shoulders and european hats upon their heads they informed us that there was very little demand for slaves on the coast and no vessel had arrived for some months past on hearing this the sarawulis who had travelled with us from the falme river separated themselves and their slaves from the coffle they had not they said 
the means of maintaining their slaves in gambia until a vessel should arrive and were unwilling to sell them to disadvantage they therefore departed to the northward for kaja we continued our route through the wilderness and travelled all day through a rugged country covered with extensive thickets of bamboo at sunset to our great joy we arrived at a pool of water near a large taba tree whence the place is called tabagi and here we rested a few hours the water at this season of the year is by no means plentiful in these woods and as the days were unsufferably hot karfa proposed to travel in the night accordingly about eleven o'clock the slaves were taken out of their irons and the people of the coffle received orders to keep close together as well to prevent the slaves from attempting to escape as on account of the wild beasts we travelled with great alacrity until daybreak when it was discovered that a free woman had parted from the coffle in the night her name was called until the woods resounded but no answer being given we conjectured that she had either mistaken the road or that a lion had seized her unperceived at length it was agreed that four people should go back a few miles to a small rivulet where some of the coffle had stopped to drink as we passed in the night and that the coffle should wait for their return the sun was about an hour high before the people came back with the woman who they found lying fast asleep by the stream we now resumed our journey and about eleven o'clock reached a walled town called tambacunda where we were well received here we remained four days on account of a palaver which was held on the following occasion moda lemina one of the slatties belonging to the coffle had formerly married a woman of this town who had borne him two children he afterwards went to manding and remained there eight years without sending any account of himself during all that time to his deserted wife who seeing no prospect of his return at the end of three years had married another man to whom she had likewise borne two children lamina now claimed his wife but the second husband refused to deliver her up insisting that by the laws of africa when a man had been three years absent from his wife without giving her notice of his being alive the woman is at liberty to marry again after all the circumstances had been fully investigated in an assembly of the chief men it was determined that the wife should make her choice and be at liberty either to return to the first husband or continue with the second as she alone should think proper favorable as this determination was to the lady she found it a difficult matter to make up her mind and requested time for consideration but i think i could perceive that first love would carry the day lamima was indeed somewhat older than his rival but he was also much richer what weight the circumstance had in the scale of his wife's affections i pretend not to say on the morning of the twenty sixth we departed from tambacunda karfa observed to me that there was no shade trees farther to the westward than this town i had collected and brought with me from manding the leaves and flowers of this tree but they were so greatly bruised on the road that i had thought it best to gather another specimen at this place the appearance of the fruit evidently places the shade tree in the natural order of sapoti and it has some resemblance to the madhuka tree described by lieutenant charles hamilton in the asiatic researches volume one page three hundred 
about one o'clock on the morning of the twenty sixth we reached sibi killin a walled village but the inhabitants having the character of inhospitality towards strangers and of being much addicted to theft we did not think proper to enter the gate we rested a short time under a tree and then continued our route until it was dark when we halted for the night by a small stream running towards the gambia next day the road led over a wild and rocky country everywhere rising into hills and abounding with monkeys and wild beasts in the rivulets among the hills we found great plenty of fish this was a very hard day's journey and it was not until sunset that we reached the village of kunbu near to which are the ruins of a large town formerly destroyed by war the inhabitants of kunbu like those of sibi killin have so bad a reputation that strangers seldom lodge in the village we accordingly rested for the night in the fields where we erected temporary huts for our protection there being great appearance of rain may twenty eighth we departed from kumbu and slept at a fula town about seven miles to the westward from which on the day following having crossed a considerable branch of the gambia called nilokoba we reached a well inhabited part of the country here are several towns within sight of each other collectively called tenda but each is distinguished also by its particular name we lodged at one of them called koba tenda where we remained the day following in order to procure provisions for our support in crossing the simbani woods on the thirtieth we reached jalakata a considerable town but much infested by fula banditti who come through the woods from bondu and steal everything they can lay their hands on a few days before our arrival they had stolen twenty head of cattle and on the day following made a second attempt but were beaten off and one of them was taken prisoner here one of the slaves belonging to the coffle who had travelled with great difficulty for the last three days was found unable to proceed any farther his master a singing man proposed therefore to exchange him for a young slave girl belonging to one of the town's people the poor girl was ignorant of her fate until the bundles were all tied up in the morning and the coffle ready to depart when coming with some other young women to see the coffle set out her master took her by the hand and delivered her to the singing man never was a face of serenity more suddenly changed into one of the deepest distress the terror she manifested on having the load put upon her head and the rope fastened round her neck and the sorrow with which she bade adieu to her companions were truly affecting about nine o'clock we crossed a large plain covered with siboa trees a species of palm and came to the river near eco a branch of the gambia this was but a small river at this time but in the rainy season it is often dangerous to travellers as soon as we had crossed this river the singing men began to vociferate a particular song expressive of their joy at having got safe into the west country or as they expressed it the land of the setting sun the country was found to be very level and the soil a mixture of clay and sand in the afternoon it rained hard and we had recourse to the common negro umbrella a large cibola leaf which being placed upon the head completely defends the whole body from the rain we lodged for the night under the shade of a large taba tree near the ruins of a village 
on the morning following we crossed a stream called new Lico, and about two o'clock to my infinite joy i saw myself once more on the banks of the gambia which at this place being deep and smooth is navigable but the people told me that a little lower down the stream is so shallow that the coffles frequently cross it on foot june second we departed from c secunda and passed a number of villages at none of which was the coffle permitted to stop although we were all very much fatigued it was four o'clock in the afternoon before we reached baraconda where we rested one day departing from baraconda on the morning of the fourth we reached in a few hours medina the capital of the king of woolly's dominions from whom the reader may recollect i received a hospitable reception in the beginning of december seventeen ninety five in my journey eastward i immediately inquired concerning the health of my good old benefactor and learned with great concern that he was dangerously ill as carfa would not allow the coffle to stop i could not present my respects to the king in person but i sent him word by the officer to whom we paid customs that his prayers for my safety had not been unfailing we continued our route until sunset when we lodged at a small village a little to the westward of kutakunda and on the day following arrived at jindi where eighteen months before i had parted from my friend dr Laidley an interval during which i had not beheld the face of a christian nor once heard the delightful sound of my native language being now arrived within a short distance of pisania from whence my journey originally commenced and learning that my friend carfa was not likely to meet with an immediate opportunity of selling his slaves on the gambia it occurred to me to suggest to him that he would find it for his interest to leave them at jinde until a market should offer carfa agreed with me in this opinion and hired from the chief man of the town huts for their accommodation and a piece of land on which to employ them in raising corn and other provisions for their maintenance with regard to himself he declared that he would not quit me until my departure from africa we set out accordingly carfa myself and one of the fulas belonging to the coffle early on the morning of the ninth but although i was now approaching the end of my tedious and toilsome journey and expected in another day to meet with countrymen and friends i could not part for the last time with my unfortunate fellow-travellers doomed as i know most of them to be to a life of captivity and slavery in a foreign land without great emotion during a wearisome peregrination of more than five hundred british miles exposed to the burning rays of a tropical sun these poor slaves amidst their own infinitely greater sufferings would commiserate mine and frequently of their own accord bring water to quench my thirst and at night collect branches and leaves to prepare me a bed in the wilderness we parted with reciprocal expressions of regret and benediction my good wishes and prayers were all i could bestow upon them and it afforded me some consolation to be told that they were sensible i had no more to give my anxiety to get forward admitting of no delay on the road we reached ten dacunda in the evening and were hospitably received at the house of an aged black female called senoria camilla a person who resided many years at the english factory and spoke our language 
I was known to her before I had left the Gambia at the outset of my journey. But my dress and figure were now so different from the usual appearance of a European, she was very excusable in mistaking me for a Moor. When I told her my name and country, she surveyed me with great astonishment, and seemed unwilling to give credit to the testimony of her senses. She assured me that none of the traders on the Gambia ever expected to see me again, having been informed long ago that the Moors of Ludamar had murdered me, as they had murdered Major Houghton. I inquired for my two attendants, Johnson and Demba, and learned with great sorrow that neither of them was returned. Carfa, who had never before heard people converse in English, listened to us with great attention. Everything he saw seemed wonderful. The furniture of the house, the chairs, etc., and particularly beds with curtains, were objects of his great admiration. And he asked me a thousand questions concerning the utility and necessity of different articles to some of which i found it difficult to give satisfactory answers on the morning of the tenth mr robert ainsley having learned that i was at tendakunda came to meet me and politely offered me the use of his horse he informed me that dr laidley had removed all his property to a place called kai a little farther down the river and that he was then gone to Dum Asana with his vessel to purchase rice, but would return in a day or two. He therefore invited me to stay with him at Pisania until the doctor's return. I accepted the invitation, and being accompanied by my friend Carfa, reached Pisania about ten o'clock. Mr. Ainsley's schooner was lying at anchor before the place this was the most surprising object which carfa had yet seen he could not easily comprehend the use of the masts sails and rigging nor did he conceive that it was possible by any sort of contrivance to make so large a body move forwards by the common force of the wind the manner of fastening together the different planks which composed the vessel and filling up the seams as so to exclude the water was perfectly new to him and i found that the schooner with her cable and anchor kept carfa in deep meditation the greater part of the day about noon on the twelfth dr laidley returned from doom masana and received me with great joy and satisfaction as one risen from the dead Finding that the wearing apparel which I had left under his care was not sold or sent to England, I lost no time in resuming the English dress and disrobing my chin of its venerable encumbrance. Carfa surveyed me in my British apparel with great delight, but regretted exceedingly that I had taken off my beard, the loss of which, he said, had converted me from a man into a boy. Dr. Laidley readily undertook to discharge all the pecuniary engagements which I had entered into since my departure from the Gambia, and took my draft upon the association for the amount. My agreement with Carfa, as I have already related, was to pay him the value of one prime slave, for which I had given him my bill upon Dr. Laidley before we departed from Camellia, for in case of my death on the road, I was unwilling that my benefactor should be a loser, but in this good creature had continued to manifest towards me so much kindness that I thought I made him but an inadequate recompense when I told him that I was now to receive double the sum I had originally promised, and Dr. Laidley assured him that he was ready to deliver the goods 
to that amount whenever he thought proper to send for them carfa was overpowered by this unexpected token of my gratitude and still more so when he heard that i intended to send a handsome present to the good old schoolmaster fan kuma at malakota he promised to carry up the goods along with his own and dr laidley assured him that he would exert himself in assisting him to dispose of his slaves to the best advantage the moment a slave vessel should arrive these and other instances of attention and kindness shown him by dr laidley were not lost upon carfa he would often say to me my journey has indeed been prosperous but observing the improved state of our manufactures and our manifest superiority in the arts of civilized life he would sometimes appear pensive and exclaim with an involuntary sigh fado thing inta thing black men are nothing at other times he would ask me with great seriousness what could possibly have induced me who was no trader to think of exploring so miserable a country as africa he meant by this to signify that after what i must have witnessed in my own country nothing in africa could in his opinion deserve a moment's attention i have preserved these little traits of character in this worthy negro not only from regard to the man but also because they appear to me to demonstrate that he possessed a mind above his condition and to such of my readers as love to contemplate human nature in all varieties and to trace its progress from rudeness to refinement i hope the account i have given of this poor african will not be unacceptable no european vessel had arrived at gambia for many months previous to my return from the interior and as the rainy season was now setting in i persuaded carfa to return to his people at jindi he parted with me on the fourteenth with great tenderness but as i had little hopes of being able to quit africa for the remainder of the year i told him as the fact was that i expected to see him again before my departure in this however i was luckily disappointed and my narrative now hastens to its conclusion for on the fifteenth the ship charleston an american vessel commanded by mr charles harris entered the river she came for slaves intending to touch at goree to fill up and to proceed from thence to south carolina as the european merchants on the gambia had at this time a great many slaves on hand they agreed with the captain to purchase the whole of his cargo consisting chiefly of rum and tobacco and deliver him slaves to the amount in the course of two days this afforded me such an opportunity of returning though by a circuitous route to my native country as i thought was not to be neglected i therefore immediately engaged my passage in this vessel for america and having taken leave of dr laidley to whose kindness i was so largely indebted and my other friends on the river i embarked at kei on the seventeenth day of june our passage down the river was tedious and fatiguing and the weather was so hot moist and unhealthy that before our arrival at goree four of the seamen the surgeon and three of the slaves had died of fevers at goree we were detained for want of provisions until the beginning of october the number of slaves received on board this vessel both on the gambia and at goree was one hundred and thirty of whom about twenty-five had been 
i suppose of free condition in africa as most of these being bushreens could write a little arabic nine of them had become captives in the religious war between abu Qadar and tamel mentioned in the latter part of the preceding chapter two of the others had seen me as i passed through bondu and many of them had heard of me in the interior countries my conversation with them in their native language gave them great comfort and as the surgeon was dead i consented to act in a medical capacity in his room for the remainder of the voyage they had in truth need of every consolation in my power to bestow not that i observed any wanton acts of cruelty practised either by the master or the seamen towards them but the mode of confining and securing negroes in the american slave ships owing chiefly to the weakness of their crews being abundantly more rigid and severe than in british vessels employed in the same traffic made these poor creatures to suffer greatly and a general sickness prevailed amongst them besides the three who died on the gambia and six or eight while we remained at goree eleven perished at sea and many of the survivors were reduced to a very weak and emaciated condition in the midst of these distresses the vessel after having been three weeks at sea became so extremely leaky as to require constant exertion at the pumps it was found necessary therefore to take some of the ablest of the negro men out of irons and employ them in this labor in which they were often worked beyond their strength this produced a complication of miseries not easily to be described we were however relieved much sooner than i expected for the leak continuing to gain upon us notwithstanding our utmost exertions to clear the vessel the seamen insisted on bearing away for the west indies as affording the only chance of saving our lives accordingly after some objections on the part of the master we directed our course for antigua and fortunately made that island in about thirty-five days after our departure from goree yet even at this juncture we narrowly escaped destruction for on approaching the northwest side of the island we struck on the diamond rock and got into st john's harbor with great difficulty the vessel was afterwards condemned as unfit for sea and the slaves as i have heard were ordered to be sold for the benefit of the owners at this island i remained ten days when the chesterfield packet homeward bound from the leeward islands touching at st john's for the antigua mail i took my passage in that vessel we sailed on the twenty fourth of november and after a short but tempestuous voyage arrived at falmouth on the twenty second of december from whence i immediately set out for london having been absent from england two years and seven months End of Volume 2, Chapter 26 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 2, Note of Travels in the Interior of Africa by Mungo Park This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Note The following passage from James Montgomery's poem the west indies published in eighteen ten was inspired by mungo park's travels in the interior of africa it enshrines in english verse the beautiful incident of the negro woman's song of charity on page one hundred and ninety of the first of these two volumes and closes with the poet's blessing upon mungo park himself who had sailed five years before upon the second journey from which he had not returned 
and whose fate did not become known until five years later man through all ages of revolving time unchanging man in every varying clime deems his own land of every land the pride beloved by heaven or all the world beside his home the spot of earth supremely blessed a dearer sweeter spot than all the rest and is the negro outlawed from his birth is he alone a stranger on the earth is there no shed whose peeping roof appears so lovely that it fills his eyes with tears no land whose name in exile heard will dart ice through its veins and lightning through his heart ah yes beneath the beams of brighter skies his home amidst his father's country lies there with the partner of his soul he shares love mingled pleasures love divided cares there as with nature's warmest filial fire he soothes his blind and feeds his helpless sire his children sporting round his hut behold how they shall cherish him when he is old trained by example from their tenderest youth to deeds of charity and words of truth is he not blessed behold at closing day the negro village swarms abroad to play he treads the dance through all its rapturous rounds to the wild music of barbarian sounds or stretch at ease where broad palmettos shower delicious coolness in his shadowy bower he feasts on tales of witchcraft that give birth to breathless wonder or ecstatic mirth yet most delighted when in rudest rhymes the minstrel wakes the song of elder times when men were heroes slaves to beauty's charms and all the joys of life were love and arms is not the negroes blessed his generous soil with harvest plenty crowns his simple toil more than his wants his flocks and fields afford he loves to greet a stranger at his board the winds were roaring and the white man fled the rains of night descended on his head the poor white man sat down beneath our tree weary and faint and far from home was he for him no mother fills with milk the bowl no wife prepares the bread to cheer his soul pity the poor white man who sought our tree no wife no mother and no home has he thus sang the negro's daughters once again oh that poor white man might hear that strain whether the victim of the treacherous moor or from the negro's hospitable door spurned as a spy from europe's hateful clime and left to perish for thy country's crime or destined still when all thy wanderings cease on albion's lovely lap to rest in peace pilgrim in heaven or earth where'er thou be angels of mercy guide and comfort thee a note to the same poem gives the following record of facts substantiated in a court of justice in which there can be only one answer to the question which were the savages in this year seventeen eighty three certain underwriters desired to be heard against gregson and others of liverpool in the case of ship zong captain collingwood alleging that the captain on officers of the said vessel threw overboard one hundred and thirty-two slaves alive into the sea in order to defraud them by claiming the value of the said slaves as if they had been lost in a natural way in the course of the trial which afterwards came on 
it appeared that the slaves on board the zong were very sickly that sixty of them had already died and several were ill and likely to die when the captain proposed to james kessel the mate and others to throw several of them overboard stating that if they died a natural death the loss would fall upon the owners of the ship but that if they were thrown into the sea it would fall upon the underwriters he selected accordingly one hundred and thirty-two of the most sickly of the slaves fifty-four of these were immediately thrown overboard and forty-two were made to be partakers of their fate on the succeeding day in the course of three days afterwards the remaining twenty-six were brought upon deck to complete the number of victims the first sixteen submitted to be thrown into the sea but the rest with noble resolution would not suffer the offices to touch them but leapt after their companions and shared their fate the plea which was set up in behalf of this atrocious and unparalleled act of wickedness was that the captain discovered when he made the proposal that he had only two hundred gallons of water on board and that he had missed his port it was proved however in answer to this that no one had been put upon short allowance and that as if providence had determined to afford an unequivocal proof of the guilt a shower of rain fell and continued for three days immediately after the second lot of slaves had been destroyed by means of which they might have filled many of their vessels with water and thus have prevented all necessity for the destruction of the third mr granville sharp who after many years of struggle first obtained the decision of a court of justice that there are no slaves in england was present at this trial and procured the attendance of a shorthand writer to take down the facts which should come out in the course of it these he gave to the public afterwards he communicated them also with a copy of the trial to the lords of the admiralty as the guardians of justice upon the seas and to the duke of portland as principal minister of state no notice however was taken by any of these of the information which has been thus sent to them another incident of the middle passage suggested that james montgomery a poem called the voyage of the blind it was that fatal and perfidious bark built in the eclipse and rigged with curses dark milton's lycidius the ship le rodure captain b of two hundred tons burthen left haver on the twenty fourth of january eighteen nineteen for the coast of africa and reached her destination on the fourteenth of march following anchoring at bonny on the river calabar the crew consisting of twenty-two men enjoyed good health during the outward voyage and during their stay at bonny where they continued till the sixth of april they had observed no trace of ophthalmia among the natives and it was not until fifteen days after they had set sail on their return voyage and the vessel was near the equator that they perceived the first symptoms of this frightful malady it was then remarked that the negroes who to the number of one sixty were crowded together in the hold and between the decks had contracted a considerable redness of the eyes which spread with singular rapidity no great attention was at first paid to these symptoms which were thought to be caused only by the want of air in the hold and by the scarcity of water which had already begun to be felt at this time they were limited to eight ounces of water a day for each person which quantity was afterwards reduced to the half of a wine glass by the advice of m, m. magnum the surgeon of the ship 
the negroes who had hitherto remained shut up in the hold were brought upon deck in succession in order that they might breathe a purer air but it became necessary to abandon this expedient salutary as it was because many of the negroes affected with nostalgia a passionate longing to return to their native land threw themselves into the sea locked in each other's arms the disease which had spread itself so rapidly and frightfully among the africans soon began to infect all on board the danger also was greatly increased by a malignant dysentery which prevailed at the time the first of the crew who caught it was a sailor who slept under the deck near the grated hatch which communicated with the hold the next day a landsman was seized with ophthalmia and in three days more the captain and the whole ship's company except one sailor who remained at the helm were blinded by the disorder all means of cure which the surgeon employed while he was able to act proved ineffectual the sufferings of the crew which were otherwise intense were aggravated by the apprehension of revolt among the negroes and the dread of not being able to reach the west indies if the only sailor who had hitherto escaped the contagion and on whom their whole hope rested should lose his sight like the rest this calamity had actually befallen the leon a spanish vessel which the rodeur met on her passage and the whole of those crew having become blind were under the necessity of altogether abandoning the direction of their ship these unhappy creatures as they passed earnestly entreated the charitable interference of the seamen of the rodeur but these under their own affliction could neither quit their vessel to go on board the leon nor receive the crew of the latter into the rodeur where on account of the cargo of negroes there was scarcely room for themselves the vessels therefore soon parted company and the leon was never seen nor heard of again so far as could be traced at the publication of this narrative in all probability then it was lost on the fate of this vessel the poem is founded the rodeur reached guadeloupe on the twenty first of june eighteen nineteen her crew being in a most deplorable condition of the negroes thirty-seven had become perfectly blind twelve had lost each an eye and fourteen remained otherwise blemished by the disease of the crew twelve including the surgeon had entirely lost their sight five escaped with an eye each and four were partially injured end of volume two note recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c end of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park